Welcome to something special. Welcome to TEDx. This TEDx event is part of a global conversation that takes place every day in every corner of the world. In schools, in theaters, in workplaces, even in prisons, people gather to hear the best ideas bubbling up in their communities. More than 3,000 TEDx events are held every year in 170 countries. It's a remarkable thing. TEDx events are self-organized under a license from TED, a nonprofit organization devoted to discovering and sharing powerful ideas in the form of TED Talks. It's not TED itself, but your local TEDx team of volunteers that has done all the work to put on today's event, including booking all of the speakers. It's this team's ideas, dedication, and time that have made this possible. We really hope today's program sparks an exciting conversation. This is a day for curiosity and for skepticism, for inspiration and for action. The more you enter into it, the more you will take out. And now, on with the show. Welcome to TEDx Seattle. I'm Nick Hart, TEDx Seattle's organizer, and I'm thrilled to welcome you to this year's event. In a normal year, we'd be gathered in person, but as we all know, 2020 has been anything but normal. This year, our team has worked outside the box, embracing this new type of normal to bring you something fantastic and hopeful. An event we believe that will spark conversations, provide opportunities for growth, offer different perspectives, and allow you to connect with amazing people who inspire you. In just a minute, we'll head down to the studio where we'll catch up live with our host for the day, Deborah Wong. But before we do, I want to first take a moment to thank our partners. It's because of our partners we're able to offer today's entire event for free. We believe in a shared mission, that we can build a better, stronger community by elevating and spreading great ideas. There's one partner in particular who's helped us along this journey for over five years. Without the support of WSCCU, I can say with confidence TEDx Seattle would not be who we are today. We've also brought on board a bunch of new partners this year that we're excited to welcome into the TEDx Seattle family. You'll have an opportunity to hear from most of them throughout the day today, but just to give a few quick shout outs, Microsoft, Segway, Alaska Airlines, King 5, Comcast Washington, and KCTS 9, thank you. I'd also like to take this opportunity to acknowledge the land that we're on here today in Seattle, the unceded ancestral lands of the Duwamish people, both past and present. Now, even though we can't be with you all in person, we're so excited to spend the day together. So get comfy for today's talks as we ride through this journey together. We hope you will laugh, we think you might cry, we know you will learn something, but most importantly, we hope you walk away with a few new ideas that you're ready to share with the rest of the world. With that, I think it's time to segue down to the studio and kick off today's talks. Shall we take the scenic route? While we're on our way to the live studio, I thought I'd take you by some of the places that make our city so special. And at the same time, tell you a bit about the history of TEDx Seattle and this year's event. We might even run into some friendly Seattleites along the way. Oh, hey. Uh, go ahead. No, you go, man. No, you go. No, after you, please. You want me to go? Wait, no, no. no you, you go. go. Okay, you go. No, 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 okay. you go. Oh, man. Okay. <laughs> okay, actually. Yeah, go. All right, yeah, yeah. okay. I should let him go. When the TEDx program started in 2009, our team in Seattle picked up one of the very first licenses. Fast forward 11 years, our event is now one of the longest standing and largest in the world. 
It's grown into an incredible event with talented speakers and performers, all with ideas worth spreading. And in recent years, we've had a happy home at McCaw Hall with 12 speakers in front of an audience of 3,000. McCaw is dark this year, but we're thrilled to be lighting up the internet with our reimagined live broadcast. Nick! Lauren, hey! Where are you going so fast? TEDx Seattle starts in like 60 seconds. Oh, I've been meaning to watch that. Yeah, well, you should. But I'm kind of far from home. Well, I think I can help with that. Whoa, sweet! Enjoy the show. See ya! Each year, TEDx Seattle is produced by a team of over 50 volunteers who love this city and are excited to bring you this year's event. It's a huge undertaking, but it's a privilege to bring speakers to the stage to share their ideas, even in a pandemic. And with all the prep work behind us, it's time to get this show on the road. All right, we are here, TEDx Seattle 2020. We are live in the studio, TEDx Seattle. We're actually live. I'm so excited to introduce you to our host for the day. She's been with us for seven years now, Deborah Wong. Thank you, Nick, and I'm so glad you got here safely. It's good to see you. And hi, everyone. It's great to see you as well. Welcome again to TEDx Seattle 2020. I'm Deborah Wong. I am a journalist at KUOW Public Radio, and I will lead you today through a full day of talks and performances. We even have artists here who are making art live during the show. Can't wait to see, to see all that as well. Um, now, one of the hallmarks of TEDx Seattle is that once a year, we get to come together around great ideas. Now, obviously, the coming together part is a little bit tricky this year, but that's okay. We can still connect. We would love it if you would join us on social media. We'd love to hear your thoughts, your questions, what inspires you, what resonates with you. Just use the hashtag TEDxSeattle on Instagram or Twitter, or you can tag us on any of your social media posts. We'll have people here who are engaging with you, and they'll pull some comments aside for me to read during the show. Now, here's another reason to get in touch with us. We have never done this before, but you know that segue that Nick so smoothly wrote over here this morning? We are gonna be giving one of those away in a drawing later in the show. It is a red nine bot S, and you can win it if you text the word win to 206 Three one two zero zero three three. that number on your screen. Uh, we're going to have a drawing later on in the show, and um, that's a really good reason for you to stay tuned to see if you have won. Again, text the word WIN to 206-312-0033 to enter the drawing to win a new segue. So the theme of today's TEDx Seattle 2020 is other sides. And one of my chief jobs of the day is to explore this theme with you and provide a framework for you to move through the day. Now, um, when I sat down to write this introduction though, I really had a hard time and I couldn't figure out why, but I thought about it and I realized, this was a couple of weeks ago, that I had been completely just my mind had been involved in thinking about the elections and thinking about politics. And I was really worried. I was worried by how divided this country seems to be. I was worried by how people aren't listening to each other. I was worried by definitely the fact that people don't seem to be connecting with each other when they have different political views. Um, and so this idea of other sides uh, seems like a perfect thing to talk about right now. But I just couldn't figure out what to say about how to get to a place where you can really look at other sides. So I did what I sometimes do. I reached out to friends of mine on Facebook and I posed that question. I said, what does other sides mean to you? And I got back some really thoughtful answers. Sherry wrote, other sides means intentionally seeking a different perspective as a benefit, not as a negative or a compromise. Positive embrace of different perspectives as a way of being. For Stephen, it's recognizing that his own sides continue to evolve. What I've been very opinionated about and some of the stuff I've preached on 
has changed over time, he wrote. And Tom suggested an experiment. Seek out one person with differing views, only one, and really make an effort to listen to that person with empathy and understanding. And I read these responses and something clicked for me. My mind had been caught in a single narrative that was about how tough things are and how hard it is to bridge differences. And just hearing these views on other sides kind of helped me get unstuck. So I, I wanna thank my friends on Facebook for that. Today, we are going to be considering other sides, big and small, other sides in the worlds of science and technology, art and design, race and identity, and life and death. And we hope that you will sort of march through this day with this feeling of openness in your heart and in your mind. And as Tom said, listen with empathy and respect. So that brings us to our first speaker. Dr. Jane Roskams is a neuroscientist and a big data specialist. She was the executive director of the Allen Institute on Brain Science, and she's on the faculties of the University of British Columbia and the University of Washington. Her research has focused on brain and spinal cord regeneration. Now, several years ago, she was in the midst of a huge collaboration with the NIH, and she got a call out of the blue from a stranger. And the woman said, I have a friend who's paralyzed and we're trying to raise money to send him to China for an experimental treatment. And she wanted Jane's advice on whether this was in fact a good idea. Well, Jane said, no, this is actually not a good idea. This particular treatment has not been tried successfully even on mice and rats. And please don't let your friend get on that plane. So this was sort of an aha moment for Jane. She realized that scientists have so much information that is simply not getting to the people who need it. So Jane is now determined to crack open the closed edifice of scientific discovery and create a world where all kinds of people can contribute to science, solving scientific mysteries. Here's Jane Roskams. I grew up on an independent little rock in the middle of the Irish Sea called the Isle of Man, where open was just our way of life and everyone knew everyone else's business, especially my parents, a plumber and a hairdresser, who taught me that whether you're fixing someone's hair or their toilet, working with the best tools and people can solve all of our problems. In high school, I was fascinated by science, but I found it cold and dispassionate. Its language intimidating. I sometimes still do, and yet I'm a neuroscientist. In my early 20s, I worked on Skid Row in LA and came face to face for the first time with homeless Vietnam vets and addicted moms about my own age and I absorbed the pain of mental illness staring right back at me. I decided right then that understanding how life changes our brains could help us understand each other better. Maybe help us tackle society's growing mental health cha challenges and make this world a kinder, healthier place to be. So I headed off to graduate school, got my brain scientist credentials, professored my way through a pretty exciting research career and right at its peak, stepped off neuroscience's front line to commit myself to democratizing science. Why? Because science is not working the way that we need it to. Science is still painfully out of reach to most people and scientific ignorance gets amplified daily throughout social media manipulating and eroding public trust in science with every single misinformed tweet. Ignoring science cost us over a million lives this year. But I get how this happens. 
Science can inspire great hope, but it is elitist and many of its fields, including neuroscience, are complex and siloed and riddled with failures to reproduce high profile findings. Why should the public trust us when scientists are busy competing with each other or putting data that cost millions of public dollars to fund into inaccessible silos? The good news is that most scientists do want more open collaboration and culture change. But the ecosystem that can help make that happen, open science, is only just being built. I stepped off my career treadmill to help my community team up and share what we know, break open our protected silos and invite in experts from other fields to help us change the way that science gets done. Thankfully, I found out I was not alone and together we have grown the open science movement, developing ways to look under the hood at each other's data and find ways to share our ideas, tools and software. But if we are really going to change science and make it impactful, we have to reach down from our ivory towers and include those who will be the most impacted by it. You, and that is citizen science. Some of the most inspirational neuroscience insight I ever received hasn't come from people with MDs or PhDs, but from people in the real world, savvy, wise 80 year old ladies in long-term care facilities, pregnant recovering drug addicts in women's prisons, and Baltimore daycare moms fighting the government for the vital food programs that could sustain their children's growing brains. Imagine how public trust in science could change if those citizens engage in the science that they care the most about and then maybe benefit from it. But can science really be advanced by people with no formal training in it? In 2015, I joined an Obama White House think tank, brainstorming upcoming challenges in their big data initiatives, including the Brain Initiative. I was invited back shortly after to present on how citizen engagement, a true passion of our science geek of a former president, could transform both science and experiential education. I came back with a plan. And Zoran Popovich at the University of Washington Center for Game Science and I got busy building a global neuroscience lab online. There are 8 billion people on this planet and we are as similar and yet different as the 80 billion neurons that sit inside each of our heads. In our game Mozak, you get to become part of a global village carefully tracing images of the brain's neurons, providing stunning reconstructions that neuroscientists can use. Thus far, thousands of people from 184 countries, including the Isle of Man, have participated in Mozak, carefully reconstructing the brain one neuron at a time, providing vital data that developers need to be able to take single cells and reconstruct them into a 3D brain map for understanding us. In Mozak, teen gamers and retirees work together on the same team. They feel inspired to learn and say that they feel empowered to be at the frontier of science doing things that really matter. It turns out there are many frontiers of scientific discovery that are now available to anyone with an internet. And Seattle is becoming a bit of a global hub for this. Fold It, a game out of David Baker's Institute for Protein Design at the University of Washington, has now been played by over half a million people worldwide, including my own daughter when she was in high school. Fold It gave us a challenge to figure out how proteins fold in different environments. Why is this important? 
Well, coproteins on the surface of fatal viruses are the keys that they use to lock in and attack our bodies. So far, Folded Gamers have solved coprotein structures for HIV, Ebola, and now COVID-19. Their strategies will help us to design new therapeutic locks that could save many of our lives in the next pandemic, or perhaps stop misfolded proteins from gradually destroying our brains in devastating diseases like Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, or ALS. Across South Lake Union, Sage BioNetworks, one of the world's leading open science organizations, run Dream Challenges. These are competitions, some with monetary rewards that anybody can sign on to do to solve pattern finding missions in human disease data. So far, Sage's Dream Teams have identified unique early disease biomarkers that could help diagnosis and treatment of bone damage, cardiovascular disease, cancer, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and now COVID-19. This might be a bit of a surprise, but getting some traditional scientists to accept that regular folk with no formal training could contribute to understanding their precious data has been a bit of a hard sell. But some of us knew that it was a risk worth taking and that it had to start from within. It is not that much fun being dismissed, belittled, or having your sanity questioned by some of your more traditional colleagues. But nevertheless, we persisted and have grown a global diverse discovery force of Uber drivers, retirees, teachers, comedians, lawyers, and yes, even hairdressers and plumbers who can hop on a screen anywhere in the world, help us take on big data and win. One of these is Carmen Mandel, an Argentinian amateur photographer who has used her artistic eye to produce vital data for NASA's GLOBE program. This is a program where NASA recruits people of all ages and types across the world to come in and work with their top scientists to develop new models to combat climate change. NASA also reached out this year to this planet's citizens to see if they could help them design a future when we might have to live on another one. They just completed a Lunar Lou challenge, publicly sourcing designs for how we might one day sustainably poop on the moon. I'm fairly sure that my dad, the highly competitive Air Force vet slash plumber who loved space and never had the chance to be an astronaut, would have been all over this one. In the last five years, Open and Citizen Science worldwide have assembled an amazing team that has now converged to create a sweet spot where our new scientific democracy takes off. This is where I live. It is where experts and enthusiasts work together on open data. This year, we underwent a major teen growth spurt, driving unprecedented global collaboration in scientific discovery when we were all challenged with a common enemy, COVID-19. 3D printer designs openly shared, rapidly produced masks, ventilator parts, facial shields in the parts of the world where they were most desperately needed. When international data become open, viral DNA sequence hot off the pipeline in China and early health data out of South Korean hospitals can be modeled anywhere, producing new viral assays and tracing techniques and also warning signs for us to protect the virus's most vulnerable victims worldwide. Diversity is critical in this. I'm currently working with two people-powered projects on youth mental health and dementia, where different cultural perspectives will be essential because people with different backgrounds see patterns in different ways and can then make sense of them for their own community. 
ambitious brain projects across the world are now filling our data banks with exabytes of data using technologies where we can now visualize thoughts and emotions racing through our human brain connectome, producing glorious colors as we learn, age, or become infected with a virus. Each color change is a signature of how life is influencing our brain, giving us our unique brain fingerprint. Each color change could also hold clues as to whether we might succumb to mental illness. But we can't just pop these images in an algorithm and get it to spit out magical answers telling us how we're doing. For that, we need to know the questions to ask. We need your insight and tech at the table. Scientists just can't do this alone. AI holds incredible potential for changing our future, but still cannot match the power of the incredible pattern spotting human mind. I don't need a computer program to tell me which of these I would rather eat than cuddle. Artificial intelligence needs human insight, ideas, and innovation to put that eye into AI. Seeing and understanding patterns in 4D is our superpower, something my hyper 13 year old can do better than a supercomputer. You and your mind will be needed to help shape the artificial intelligence of the future and to help keep it humane, culturally inclusive and ethical. We are at an incredible moment in history. COVID-19 might have isolated us at home, but open and citizen science have created a new scientific democracy where diverse minds anywhere can hop online and work with others in the world to begin to solve the problems of our future. The internet is your magical portal into a people-powered global revolution to accelerate scientific discovery, where you get to work along science's leaders and help carve paths of understanding through our opening silos of data. In this science democracy, we all get to share our experience as we collaborate to make discoveries that could cure diseases, hold back climate change, discover or explore new planets, help turn brain data into understanding mental health, enhance our own mental health while we're doing it, transform online education, and make science that we can all trust and believe in. You are the final piece of the jigsaw in science's new universe. Whether you are an immigrant undergraduate student developer writing open software at MIT, or a precocious plumber's daughter on an island in the middle of the Irish Sea. Thank you. That was Dr. Jane Roscombs. And since our speakers are not here live, we asked them each to pick an object that we could have here on set that would represent their talks, sort of to have something tangible here during this virtual event. And Dr. Roscombs chose this slice of brain. Actually, it's not a slice of brain. It's a piece of art and it's a 3D printed interpretation of a slice of brain. And it's amazingly intricate and detailed if you look at it. Jane says that when you hold it up to the light, uh, it creates patterns on the wall behind you. And it reminds her of the way that the brain lights up when it thinks of certain things and how our, all of our brains light up differently uh, and depending on who we are. And it's just a wonderful image of the power, the potential power of so many brains all contributing to science. Now, I wanted to just uh, give you a shout out. This is a question that I have for you. I wanted to know what you think of the term other sides. What does other sides mean to you? When you hear that phrase, what emotions does it bring up? What words does it bring us? 
Let us know on social media. Use the hashtag TEDxSeattle on Instagram or Twitter, or tag us on any of your social media posts. You can also text a short answer to 206-312-0033, and we'll read a few of your replies later on in the show. So we have something very cool happening today. We have several artists who are working on creating art live behind the scenes. And the art is inspired by some of the themes that we're exploring today. So I'd like to introduce you to them. Barry Johnson is a self-taught interdisciplinary artist whose work explores race, community, and culture. Most recently, Barry authored and illustrated a children's book titled, Oh, What Wonderful Hair. And Barry gave a delightful TEDx Seattle talk about the power of creating personas to help you move through life. Good to see you again, Barry. And Barry, it looks like you're it looks like you're with Moses. Moses, son, um, you are a, an artist as well. You create analog, digital, and mixed media art, and you draw much of your inspiration from your Southern upbringing, along with Black, African, Asian, and Latinx diasporas. Moses, welcome to you. And also we have Kate Wallach on the line. She is an artist, director, choreographer, and educator. She's the founder of Dance Church and Studio Kate Wallach, a nonprofit arts organization dedicated to cultivating a community of artists through dance-based design forward experiences. Welcome to you, Kate. Thank you. So Barry, I want to start with you. I know you've got the microphone there. You. So you and Moses are collaborating on a piece today. Can you tell us, uh, first of all, Moses wanted me to ask you how the two of you met. Yeah, absolutely. So it's a really beautiful story. Um, a friend of mine, Liz, who wants War Noir, asked me to write about one of the artists and their work just blew me away. It was such incredible work. And I wrote a really cool piece about them. And then I got to connect with them a few months later. And that is Moses. That's Moses. And Moses looks like he's getting started already. What are you guys working he's on He's already today? ready going. He's going. What are you working on today? So today, Moses is going to do a phenomenal, intuitive, meditative piece. It's going to look at the effects of the year in total, how it's played out. Um, some of the events that have transpired, and he's going to freestyle, freehand the entire experience across this large canvas behind us. The entire year of 2020, that is a huge, that is a really tall order. <laughs> I can't imagine like right, summing up exactly. 2020, but that's a big piece of canvas. So you've got a lot to work with. So what, what, kinds of, what kinds of things, what kind of images, what kind of thoughts um, have you been talking about um, to get ready for this piece of art? You know, it, it's been everything. Um, a lot of the response to police violence, the election, the, you know, fight for social justice, like inclusion, equity. It's, it's like you said, Deb, it's been like a massive year. So, you know, it won't show up in the way of just plain images and words. It's going to be meditative, intuitive, and it's going to be one of those things that you'll be able to watch come to life throughout the day. It looks like it's taking shape already. Um, Barry, thank you so much. Uh, hang, hang out for a second while we talk to Kate Wallach. So Kate, Absolutely. tell me, where are you and what are you planning today? Hi. Um, well, I'm currently in my bedroom. Uh, and today, uh, this will be my canvas. This will be my stage, my set, my dance floor. Um, yeah. And uh, do you have an inspiration for the dance that you're going to create for us today? So similar to uh, Barry and Moses, I think, uh, you know, this year has been so much. And uh, when I think about other sides, it reminds me of process. It reminds me of how to get from point A to point B. It reminds me of pivoting. <laughs> it reminds me of experimenting and improvisation. Um, so today, uh, with this as my my dance floor, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to do that. I'm going to move. I'm going to rearrange. I'm going to pack. I'm going to unpack. I'm going to compose. I'm going to decompose to develop something throughout the day. 
Uh, it sounds like the perfect pandemic piece of art. What's it been like as a dancer not to be able to go to a studio or to perform in front of audiences in a performance space? What it's, what's that been like for you? Uh, it's, our, it's our whole life, touching, moving, dancing, rolling around. It's, it, you viscerally feel that when you're not able to, to, to touch and to experience in the same way. Um, but I think I speak for not only myself, but a lot of other dance artists that um, this has also opened up a, a new opportunity for a lot of us to be like, how, what does it mean to, to make dance in new spaces? What does it mean to engage in a new way that's just not a proscenium? Um, so yeah, it's, it's been difficult, but at the same time, it's been opening and experimenting and finding new ways to, to move. Kate, we're really looking forward to seeing what you come up with later today. And we're also gonna check in with Barry and Moses to see what they are doing. And then towards the end of today, we will reveal your final pieces. Thanks so much. And we'll see you guys later. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so this year we have seen an extraordinary national reckoning around race and racism. George Floyd's killing by police had a profound impact on many Americans and millions of people both here and abroad took to the streets to protest. In the wake of that movement, uh, we saw a lot of attitudes about racism shifting and polls showed many more people acknowledging the existence of institutionalized racism than ever before. So now what? How do we move forward and have constructive conversations about race and racism? Well, our next guest, our next, next speaker has some thoughts on that. Dr. Caprice Hollins grew up in a multicultural, multiracial household. She is now a clinical psychologist and her specialty is multicultural and community psychology. She is a master as well at conversations. And she says it's often hard to talk with white people about race because they tend to approach those conversations very differently than do people of color. Here's Dr. Caprice Hollins. I was facilitating a workshop on implicit bias to a group which included law enforcement. There were about 70 participants in the room, most of whom were white. I knew it wasn't going to be easy, particularly given it was a mandatory learning opportunity and the fact that I'm a black woman and a civilian wasn't going to help. Early on in the workshop, I asked one man how he identified racially. It's best not to assume because you can't always tell based on the color of someone's skin. I've made that mistake before. His response, American. In that moment, I knew he was white. We don't know how to have healthy, productive conversations about race, racism, and race relations in this country. Many white people grow up in towns where there are very few, if any, people of color. Even those who do grow up in diverse communities will say race wasn't talked about. And then there are those are taught racism is a thing of the past. So it's usually not until white people leave that town, go off to college, date a person of color, or join an organization where they began talking about race or even exploring what it means to be white. But parents of color, of children of color, tend to talk with their children about race. Most of us can tell you an early experience of racism. So by the time we become adults, not only do we understand what it means to be a person of color in this country, we're more prepared for the experiences we're likely to face. Our differences in experiences and what we've been taught cause white people and people of color to take very different approaches to race conversations. 
People of color will often speak to our collective experiences. For example, black people will use language like we, us, and my people, acknowledging our identities make us a part of a larger group. White people, on the other hand, are encouraged to operate under colorblind thinking. They'll take three approaches that ignore the impact of race on our daily lives. One common way white people will engage in race conversations is the universal approach. The universal approach is when white people react to racism by saying, we're all human, we all bleed, why do we have to talk about differences? Talking about differences just divide us. Talking about differences doesn't divide us. It's not acknowledging racism still exists and not talking about it that does that. We're all human. We all bleed. Y'all, before stepping on this stage, I didn't think to myself, I wonder how many watching will be human. That we're all human should be a given. Speaking universally does not move race conversations forward. We do need to keep it as a part of the conversation because quite frankly, we don't treat everybody in this country as if they're human. But that's not what race conversations are about. Another common way white people will engage in conversations about race is the individual approach. The individual approach is when white people talk about who they are as individuals. I have children who are Asian. I work with someone who's Latino. My best friend is native and my favorite. I don't care if you're black, purple, blue, or green. When you try to hold them accountable for that thing they said or did that was offensive. These are all attempts at colorblind thinking. I want to pause here for a moment and let my white brothers and sisters and non-binary friends in on a little secret. The moment you tell a person of color you don't notice their race, you're actually letting them know you notice their race. I mean, think about it. When was the last time you met a white person and said to them, I just want you to know I don't see color? Colorblind thinking comes from a good place. When I hear it, I think white people are trying to tell me they're not racist, they won't treat me unfairly because of my race, and they won't judge me because of our differences. But what I want to know is, why does an important part of who I am have to go away in order for you to do those things? I mean, why can't I be black and you treat me fairly, work on your bias, and become an anti-racist? Colorblind thinking is a part of early socialization for white people. Did you know it's about the age of three when children begin to ask us all those questions when we realize we're not as smart as we thought we were? Let's imagine there's a white child, she's three years old, riding the bus. She asks her mom, Mommy, why is that man so chocolate? And the chocolate man can hear her ask the question. He's not tripping. He knows that when children are curious, they ask questions in this way. Who's he paying attention to? The mom. He's probably thinking, I wonder how she's going to handle this one. And what do parents do in these moments when children ask questions loud enough so the person who is different can hear? We shush them. And what's the message? that children get. Not only do they learn it's not okay to talk about differences, they get a deeper, more damaging message. It's not okay to be different. Then when white children become adults, they'll say anything about a person other than their race. You see that person over there in the purple hat and blue shoes and green coat? You mean the Asian one? Why didn't you just say so? They know they're Asian, by the way. Imagine instead of shushing their children. Parents normalized our differences. Maybe this mom says to her child, honey, people are lots of different colors. She holds out her hand and asks, what color are we? We're all human. We all bleed. But that's not what race conversations are about. They're about the group approach. 
the group approach is where we become curious about collective experiences. What's it like for women to work the same jobs as men but get paid less? What's it like for people to have disabilities and have to advocate every day for access to opportunities that others take for granted? What's it like to be second, third, fourth generation Asian or Latino and have people tell you, you speak such good English? I met a woman once who said when people tell her she speaks such good English, she says to them, thank you, you do too. What's it like to be black, brown, indigenous, and be killed by police at much higher rates than your white counterparts, even when unarmed? Let's take a look at the Black Lives Matter movement, a group approach to better understand how these other two approaches take us off course, preventing us from moving race conversations forward. A common reaction to Black Lives Matter is, all lives matter. Do all lives matter? Of course they do. And if you're still contemplating whether all lives matter, you're thinking about this way too deeply. Yes, all lives matter. Another typical reaction to Black Lives Matter is blue lives matter. Do blue lives matter? Of course they do. Blue Lives Matter is an example of the third approach white people take to race conversations. It reminds me of times when my husband and I will argue. I'll tell him something he does that bothers me. He'll defend himself by saying, well, what about when you do? And he'll start listing off all these things that I do that bother him but have nothing to do with what I was trying to bring to his attention. This takes the focus away from my concern and places it on his. Listen, I can't imagine what it would be like to have a job that was so dangerous. Every time I left for work, I didn't know if I would ever see my family again. But the saying blue lives matter wouldn't exist if it wasn't for black lives matter. It is a reaction to the Black Lives Matter movement, and it is another group. Black people were never questioning whether blue lives matter, nor were we suggesting that all police are bad. In fact, blue lives matter fails to recognize that black people also have loved ones in our lives who are in law enforcement. And besides, people are not born blue. The Black Lives Matter movement is about structural racism. If we are ever going to effectively address race, racism, and race relations in this country, it means we must also talk about what it means to be white. Our white brothers and sisters and non-binary friends struggle with this. They're not used to looking at themselves as a part of a racial group. If you are white, one way you can assess whether taking the group approach to race conversations is difficult for you. Examine how you felt hearing me say white people 15 times throughout this talk, and I'm not even finished yet. You may have thought to yourself, I'm not like that. Why is she trying to make us feel guilty for being white? Or maybe you shifted the focus to your own marginalized group. What she needs to be talking about is gender equality. Poverty is the real issue. What about disabilities? Nobody seems to be talking about that. Or maybe you went to your relationships. I dated a black guy as proof you're not like one of those white people I've been talking about. This in part is what it means to have white privilege. The individual white you is innocent until you prove yourself guilty. People of color rarely get to be seen as individuals. We are guilty until we prove ourselves innocent. When white people go to the universal, to the individual, or deflect the conversation to another group experience, 
they're actually colluding with racism. The conversation becomes about whether all lives matter, how your one friend is all the proof you need to discredit an entire group's experience, or how the lives of police matter too. All the while, when it comes to black, brown, and indigenous people, people are shooting first and asking questions later. And I mean that figuratively and literally. John T. Williams, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Aubrey, George Floyd, Elijah McLean, Jacob Blake, William Green, Mike Ramos were all guilty first. Their race a threat, the given of their humanity, disregarded, ignored, forgotten. Their individualism negated. Dismantling structural racism means we must acknowledge it exists. Talk about the impact on the lives of people of color. Work together to pull it apart piece by piece. But that won't happen as long as our white brothers and sisters and non-binary friends aren't willing to admit race matters. So what can white people do? Deconstruct how you've been socialized and reconstruct a new way of being. Rather than seeing differences as negative or pretending you don't notice at all, recognize that it is our differences that make America great. Become aware of your bias. Acknowledge your whiteness and the privileges it holds. Take the time to learn about diverse group experiences and listen and believe the stories we tell you. Learn to become comfortable with the discomfort. Lean into it. Feel it. Wonder where it's coming from. Unpack institutional, systemic, and structural racism. And then join us in taking action to advocate for change. Because yes, we're all human. And yes, we all bleed. That's why black lives matter. Thank you. That was Dr. Caprice All Hollins giving a master class on how to have conversations about race. For her object, Caprice chose this open window to represent her talk. For her, the window represents curiosity, questioning, and wondering. It's a way to see outside our own lives and experiences. It is by looking outside our windows and into the windows of other lives that we can build our understanding of racism and begin to embrace our differences, she says. And this is going here. TEDx Seattle would not exist without an amazing group of volunteers and also our wonderful partners who provide financial support. Our presenting partner is WSECU, the Washington State Employees Credit Union, a not-for-profit, member-driven financial institution that has deep ties in the community. Here's a look at what WSECU is all about. Ideas have the power to change the world. That's why WSCCU proudly sponsors TEDx events across Washington. My name is Will Rance. I've been with the credit union for 35 years. It's time to listen, to learn, to challenge the status quo, to ask tough questions of ourselves, each other, and our community. We need to come together with a shared purpose to rewrite rules that create inequity to 
start building a better normal, not just for some, but for everyone. That's something we're invested in. We are WSECU, the credit union for Washington since 1957. We were founded on the idea of cooperation, people helping one another. The idea that money that came from the community should go back into the community, and this would make the community grow stronger. It was a radical idea for banking, and in some ways, it still is. Not for profit, but for people. We before me. WSCCU is proud to be your neighborhood credit union. We're glad to be your neighbors. And we can do better. We can be better. Together, we can put ideas into action. Together, we can create and shape the change we want to see. The only way forward is together. Let's get started. In a normal year, we would be meeting at McCaw Hall at Seattle Center. It's a fantastic venue that's home to the Pacific Northwest Ballet and the Seattle Opera. And we'd have a whole day, not just of talks, but also of performances. And we wanted to just give you a taste of what that's like. Last year, we were treated to a performance by artist uh, and rapper Hollis Wong Ware. Now, Hollis is from Seattle. She got her start right out of college. She teamed up with an up-and-coming musical duo that was trying to raise money on Kickstarter to do their first music video. That musical duo was Macklemore and Ryan Lewis, and the music video was Wings, which told the story of a boy's obsession with his Nike shoes. From TEDx Seattle 2019, here's some music from Hollis Wongware. You don't give me what I need No, but I know nobody can give me everything Lately I've been thinking you don't see what I see And I get so impatient when I really should just breathe I just breathe, yeah Gotta give a little back to me circles in my mind gotta give a little back to me hey hey I adore myself instead of just wasting all my time my time hey yeah yeah hey I can't depend on nobody to make me happy no there's beauty inside that I'm understanding now, yeah. You can't see it reflected until it's within in the way that it's been. Been wearing me thin, all of the tension up under my skin now, yeah. I don't know quite what to say, but I know I'm done pretending everything's okay. And I've been overcome. Satan trying to appease but I gotta remember I'm deserving of relief relief gotta give a little back to me yeah oh cause it's so lonely running circles in my mind I gotta give a little back to me hey 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 Instead of just wasting all my time My time, yeah I gotta pull down the curtain Taking an admission is something to miss Or am I only tripping, floating in space All the hypotheticals Think I got it, then I let it go Catch it, release, there's a piece that I'm missing I better be sweet to me, better just listen Harder to handle, I hold myself close I'm gonna Love me the most, most, most. Oh.
to me, back to me, back to me. Yeah, I gotta give a little back to me, back to me, back to me, back to me. That was Hollis Wong Ware. Her first solo album, Half Life, was just released this year in time for the pandemic. And you can hear her entire performance at TEDxSeattle.com. I want to make sure that you have all signed up for our Segway giveaway. We're going to be giving away a Segway 9Bot S later in the program. To join that drawing, you just need to text us, text the word WIN to 206-312-0033. We're going to be doing the drawing sort of towards the end of the program, so stay tuned to see if you win. Once again, the number is 206-312-0033. Text the word WIN, and we look forward to seeing who gets it. This year, we are excited to have Microsoft as one of our partners. Our partners provide the financial support to literally make TEDx Seattle possible. Now, Microsoft has its own partnerships, and these are businesses that use Microsoft technology as springboards for their own unique innovations. We're going to hear from one Microsoft partner who uses technology as a way to lift up underrepresented communities. Take a look. An inclusive economy is something we can all aspire to. Providing access to technology so more people can innovate in the digital economy will light up the future. At Microsoft, we're committed to empowering every person and organization on the planet to achieve more. We do it by working with creative thinkers and innovators who believe in using technology to create a more inclusive and sustainable world. Let's hear from Microsoft learning partner Yasmin Ali founder and CEO of Skillspire. The work they're doing will inspire you to help make our future brighter. Skillspire is a coding bootcamp that focuses specifically around underrepresented communities, minorities and women and veterans. We offer short-term courses in software engineering to bridge the divide that exists between these communities and the tech companies. When I came to this country, I did my bachelor's in computer information systems, enrolled in a master's program in computer science and completed that as well. Having worked for almost 10 years, I did take a break and that was because of my children. During that time, I got involved in a lot of community activism and primarily around education. I reached out to community colleges, Latino organizations, people who work with refugees and immigrants. Typically, these community organizations are not looking at tech as an option for their clients. They are living paycheck to paycheck. Why isn't tech an option for them? It might take a year. And the community organizations should be willing to wait and take that bet on these people. Meet them from where they are and you know, help them grow. Giving them that first opportunity and that job into that tech sector will go a long way. So we started offering courses starting from 2017, full stack web development, data analytics, Java and cloud computing, the jobs that are in demand. We've kept our courses part-time in the evenings and weekends so that it's accessible by people who are working and also kept it affordable. Students from Skillspire come from various backgrounds. Sometimes they've had prior experiences in computer science, but most people that come into this program are very beginner. It's very beginner friendly. We're starting to offer UX design as well so that we can help people who come with a creative background get into the tech sector that way. One of the ways that we have differentiated is the personal one-on-one -on -one mentorship even after they finish the course. And a lot of our instructors, they've come from coding boot camps themselves. They've come from a completely different background and switched careers. There's so much empathy that I've learned. I can't even tell you how happy it feels when you see that I've made a difference in somebody's life. You know, it has definitely made my mission stronger. The mission that we're trying to tackle is much more than the business itself.
how are we able to completely reset the mindset that we were in and make it a much more inclusive environment for the women for these different um, people of color who have you know traditionally been left out for you to be competitive in the global market, you do need diverse ideas, diversity in thought, in design. I don't think it's a choice anymore. It is an absolute need. I realize that we are a very small organization and the best way to make this happen is to partner with organizations that have that same mission. When I heard about the investment that Microsoft is making in the Digital Skills Initiative for underrepresented communities and African-American communities, it just reinforced the work that we've been doing for the past four years. So I'm very excited to see the partnership working with Microsoft to help reach these underserved populations that overlook talent. Now when I look back, how did I navigate and I think I was able to do that because I had that support, a group of advisors and mentors who I really fall back on. If Skillspire can help be that mentor, be that bridge, even if I were to change one person's life for the better, I think I've achieved my goal. Microsoft wants to invite those of you who own or operate businesses to become a Microsoft partner. Just go to our website, tedxseattle.com, and click on the Microsoft logo to sign in. And next year, they will be highlighting another local partner at TEDx Seattle, and it could be you. It is time to check in with our artists who have been hard at work behind the scenes making art. We've got uh, Moses, Son, and Barry Johnson. Hey, Barry, how's it going? Wow, you've got some stuff there. Tell us how it's going. Hey, Barry, I don't know. I can't hear you. I think you might be muted. Can you uh, see if you got something to, to press there? No, can't hear you. Let's try it again. Maybe hit refresh. Hit refresh on your computer. Oh, now it looks like. No, still can't hear you. All right, well, wait, hold on. Hey, Barry. Yep. Uh, now, now we hear you. It was probably your headset that was doing something funny. Let's try that again. Oh, no, now we can't hear you. <laughs> I'm sorry, this is, uh, this is like 2020. This is part of the art that you're creating. It's like all of our technical problems are now part of your art. Um, we can't hear you. But you know what? Why don't we go? Why don't we go back to Barry in a couple minutes? Okay? Yeah, we're gonna go back. We're gonna solve these technical problems and then go back to you and then see what great stuff that you've got going on there. Okay? Shall we move on? Let's move on. All right. At the at the top of the show, we asked you what other sides means to you, and a number of you have written to us on social media, and I just want to read some of your responses because they're fantastic. Matthew says, other sides, challenging us to live in the shoes of others, true empathy. Linda says, other sides means exploring the unknown and not understood. My friend Gil wrote in, other sides, I think of opportunity to broaden my own understanding. And Deborah says, when I think of other sides, I think of sharing food at a worldwide dinner table. And I love that one. We love hearing from you. Please continue to post on social media. Use our hashtag TEDxSeattle or tag us on any of your social media posts. So have you ever heard of an academic discipline called astrobiology? So that's astro pertaining to the stars and biology, which is the study of life. I had never heard of it. But it is a thing, and it's something that our next speaker has on his resume. Dominic Civitilli is a psychologist and an astrobiologist. He says astrobiology looks at what life might be outside of Earth, 
And the focus is often on what are called extremophiles. Those are life forms that can survive in extreme conditions like tremendous heat or cold or very low temperature. And the idea is that life on other worlds might look like the extremophiles that we find here on Earth. And the reason this matters to him is that the subject that he studies is very otherworldly. And he says, the octopus is evidence that intelligence can come in very different forms or shapes. Now, the object that, Do that uh, Dominic chose to represent his talk is this. It's a crashed UFO that his octopus calls home. We'll get to that later. Here's Dominic Civitilli. Do you ever get that feeling like you're being watched? I'm working in my marine lab one night. It's dark, but I can tell that every time I move, the subject I'm studying moves too, like I'm being followed. Its eight limbs explore the darkness around it, slithering hypnotically to the rhythm of a silent orchestra. It fixes its unblinking eyes on me. And I wonder, who is studying whom? I'm currently a graduate student, and I study octopus intelligence. In the four years that I've been studying the octopus, I've experienced this encounter again and again. I'm interested in the biological origins of the mind. There's something truly humbling knowing that human intelligence and all of its potential to create and innovate is a product of evolution, like all life on Earth. Along my academic path, I began studying invertebrates. The average human doesn't know very much about invertebrates, animals that don't have a spine or internal skeleton as we have. Yet the invertebrates make up over 95% of animal life. So it turns out, we vertebrates, we are the weird ones. I spent a summer in the San Juan Islands at Friday Harper Labs, where I had an opportunity to study an incredible diversity of invertebrates. There were tanks of urchins, sea cucumbers, sea slugs, crustaceans, anemones, shellfish, and lots of worms. Most of these animals didn't seem to mind or notice my presence. Only one animal was observing me back. The octopus was uniquely aware of its surroundings. I was fascinated by the way it moved, by its ability to coordinate its multiple jointless limbs so fluidly and so elegantly and by its ability to change its color and texture to match its surroundings. When this animal died, I looked at its skin under a microscope so I can see the elements of its camouflage abilities. It was like looking at a landscape of another planet or another dimension. Then the skin woke up. The octopus had died hours ago but its skin was moving, changing in waves of color before my eyes. The skin was alive. The octopus's body and mind seemed worlds apart from our own and that of our vertebrate kin. The octopus became a unique lens through which I could study the mind. This path has reframed my understanding of human intelligence and how we perceive and think about the world. I had wandered into the rabbit hole, but this animal is not a rabbit. Far from it. The octopus is like nothing else I've ever encountered. Octopuses don't have a skeleton. Their movement is therefore not bound by any kind of rigidity. Their arms can bend anywhere in any direction. 
the octopus can't rely on its arms being shaped the same way twice. This means, unlike other animals, the octopus lacks rhythmic pattern to its locomotion. On each of its arms, it has hundreds of suckers. Where the eight arms meet is where its beak is. The octopus has a beak, by the way. The bag behind its eyes is its body, where you'll find its organs, like its kidneys, its three hearts, and its stomach. The octopus has three hearts, by the way. They're full of fun facts. Before I talk about their brain, let's talk about ours. Our brain sits in our skulls and is highly centralized. The human brain is an immense concentration of neurons. It's a complex circuit capable of complex thought. It gives us incredible abilities to process and understand the world around us. The octopus's cognition is quite different. It's distributed. Most of its brain exists within its arms. The octopus relies on this distributed nervous system to be able to control its body. There are so many different ways for the arms to move that the brain would be overloaded if it was solely responsible for controlling them. Instead, the octopus relies on local control centers within its arms. The arms are therefore very independent. The arms and suckers can interact with the world around them with minimal feedback from the brain. You can think of the relationship between the octopus and its arms like our relationship with our technology, like our phones or our computers or our cars, which are all growing smarter by the day. They think about things so we don't have to. But this also means that there's a lot that they are thinking about that we are unaware of. I study how the arms and suckers work together to gather information from their environment, how they cooperate to explore and to solve problems. As a diver, I also spend a fair bit of time underwater trying to find them. But the octopus is an animal that evolved to not be found. With their incredible camouflage abilities, an octopus might appear as no more than a piece of kelp lined with suckers or a rock with eyes. I have likely been observed by many animals on dives when I did not see a single one. It is a humbling ritual visiting their remote world. The cold, dark, green water of the Pacific Northwest and my limited air supply seem to compound this feeling. My years of studying the octopus have felt like the study of an alien life form. But strangely, over time, I began to feel an uncanny sense of kinship with them. The unnerving feeling, like I was always being watched, eventually turned into a feeling of comfort. Like we are two otherworldly creatures mirroring each other's behavior. As I studied and observed them, they always seemed to be doing the same thing back to me. They are marvelously curious animals. When they are awake and active, they constantly wander and watch me and reach their arms into unseen corners of their tank. If they're not given something to do, something to enrich them, to stimulate them, they become very unhappy and unhealthy. They explore mostly with their arms and suckers, where they keep most of their brain. A single sucker has tens of thousands of mechanical and chemical receptors that it uses to feel and taste the, its surroundings and the world around it. A single sucker is a hundred times more sensitive than a human fingertip. Each sucker can coordinate with its neighbors to crawl, to explore, and manipulate objects. To study the octopus, I give them problem-solving tasks, then analyze how they solve them. It's an opportunity for them to satisfy their curiosity while I have a chance to satisfy mine. It's an opportunity to meet them halfway. But I'll also give them toys, prey to find and hunt, and objects with unique textures like rocks or shells or even Legos. 
A healthy and confident animal will investigate pretty much anything we add to their tanks. When they reach out for me, when we make contact, their quasi-intelligent limbs explore my skin with hundreds of coordinated sensitive suckers. I'm making contact with their body, but it feels like I'm making contact with their mind. There is still so much to learn about these animals. And with each new discovery, we learn more of what it would be like to meet and understand a completely different form of intelligence. And who knows, that might be a future for us one day. My goal is to not just understand their mind as a machine or a computer, but to be able to read them, to empathize with them, and to comprehend their experience of the world as an entirely different form of thought. I didn't expect to form such a bond with animals that seemed so alien. To be invested in an animal that is so different and so difficult to understand is an incredible emotional challenge. To finally build trust with such an animal is a very rewarding experience. This has become more than just an academic path for me. Studying the octopus has radically changed my perspective on the human mind. These mysterious and complex creatures have shown me that the human mind is just one of many possible forms of intelligence. At the end of the day, their curiosity and their drive to explore always remind me of why I do this work. How incredible that this feeling of curiosity is shared across the ancient evolutionary divide between us. This feeling was so important for us and our progress as a species. It led the way for human discovery and innovation. It has led us across the world and will one day lead us beyond. It was fundamental to technology and civilization and has led the way to pursuing the greatest mysteries of the universe. When we turn our gaze to the stars and to worlds beyond our own, when we wonder what alien forms of life are evolving in the universe around us, I would guess that someone, somewhere, is wondering the same thing. Despite our differences, what will bring us together will be our shared pursuit of the unknown. Thank you. That was Dominic Civitilli. And we've been asking the speakers to choose an object that represents their talks that we can have here on set. And this is what Dominic chose. It's a crashed UFO. This is actually from the inside of an octopus tank in his lab. The octopus uses it as a den, and they like to hide themselves because in the wild they have predators. Dominic gives his animals a lot of den options. He says it makes them happy to have places to hide and explore. And he thinks the UFO is particularly fitting because the octopus could very well be a model for extraterrestrial intelligence, which is a pretty mind-blowing idea. All right, well, we're going to try to get back to our artists, Barry Johnson and Moses' son. We had a little bit of a technical problem earlier, but uh, Barry, can you hear us? I can. Oh, awesome. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Yay. I'm glad, so glad we have you. Now, you guys are really hard to work. I know, I know. It's amazing. Uh, when technology works, it's fantastic. So, you are doing, um, we just want to remind people who are just joining us, sort of a meditation on the year 2020. How is it going? Take a look at it. You know, there's been so much progress we've been able to make. It looks beautiful Moses is doing this entire piece and we're just going through adding those more colors now as you can see Moses has introduced some blue he's got some electric yellow some white it's really coming along very beautifully it looks wonderful so tell me a little bit about the uh, the materials you're using that is it just plain black paper and and are, are those markers what what's he using yeah so these are it's plain black paper uh, looks like the paper is four foot. Um, the piece entirely looks like it's about eight feet long. And we just got a large series of markers here 
Yeah. Um, they're uh, cool. Posco latex markers. They're latex markers. They're latex. Oh, paint. nice. Yeah. Oh, yeah. great. Really. Okay. All right. So um, now you said this is a like a meditation on this incredible year that we've been having. Is it just kind of images, or are there? Do they represent like specific things that have happened during the year? Can you sort of walk us through it? Well, my hey, my practice is. Hello, how are you? Uh, my practice is usually to kind of think of a few themes. Um, and then what I do is I just kind of surrender to the muses or to the ancestors, as I like to say, and let things flow. Um, and then as they come out, you know, people will see what they will see. Some people will see maybe dragons or flowers or cities or those sort of things. But I let everything really just flow naturally versus trying to hold on to some kind of concept in my head. It's like, let, let the thoughts flow. Let, let the whole motion like flow through the drawing. Through the and is it, weird, is it weird to be in this position where you're sort of having to create on demand, like in front of an audience? Does that feel a little bit weird? Um, yes and no, because um, I kind of go into a kind of trance-like state so I don't really notice. It's more like I'm just doing my thing. This is what I do in my office, in my uh, studio. I do this on a small scale. I do it on a large scale. I've done it on murals. I've done it on, you know, eight and a half by eleven pieces of paper. So it's all just it's a practice that I've been building up over the past couple of years. And, um, it's just it's just a pretty cool opportunity overall to share it to share the process. Well, Moses, thank you so much for, for checking in with us. We are going to um, let you keep going. And then at the end of the show, we will see the actual finished piece. So Moses' son and Barry Johnson, thanks so much. And we will see you later. All right. See you later. All right. And we will be right back after another short profile from our partner, WSECU. I've been with the credit union about 35 years. I uh, have uh, cerebral palsy and dyslexia, which I call double whammy. I didn't know money or how to save it or how to make it or any of that stuff. I called the credit union to see if I could be independent or at least hope to be independent. And um, they proved to me that I could be. Somebody took the time, literally, to walk me through my problem. And it took a while to make sure I knew what I was doing and where I was going. And she helped me understand that I don't have to be afraid of money. That changed my life. You took a dream of me being independent and you made it more than just that. I'm forever grateful. I feel like the sky's the limit. My wife and me are homeowners and have the confidence to say, I know what I'm doing. I know I'm gonna be okay. These days, the spaces that we inhabit have never been more important to our lives. It feels so good to have a roof over your head and a place to retreat to during this scary time. But, you know, a lot of us are working from home, which has its challenges. And I know a lot of people miss having the structure and the, the camaraderie of a workplace. And others might struggle to do Zoom meetings from their kitchen table. But there are benefits to working from home. Like you might be noticing that you enjoy having more natural light on your workspace or fresh air or hearing the birds from your backyard. Or you might also be taking midday walks to your neighborhood park. So our next speaker thinks a lot about the places we work and how to make them better. Matthias Olt grew up in Germany and from a young age he wanted to be a scientist. He got his degree in chemistry. But after the fall of the Berlin Wall, he switched from science to architecture. He wanted to use science to create workspaces that are healthier for the human body, mind, and spirit. That has a lot to do with the brain, which is why he chose this brain monitoring device as his object. We'll tell you more about that later. Here's Matthias Olt.
I start every morning with a run. When I start, it's a slog. I'm not what you'd call in flow. My legs strain as I run uphill, working against the steep, long roadway, panting for air and focusing on every step to not slow down. And then I reach the forest trail, and after a breezy stretch, there's another long incline. However, this one is different. This time, I run along soft, leafy paths. I can see moving tree canopies that make the temporary ceiling, the fleeting sunlight that reaches the forest floor, the naturally shaped branches and roots that fly by, and I can hear the gentle sound of rain that creates a deep sound space. My mind is pulled away and I am pulled along this incline with ease. I am deep in with my thoughts, running smoothly uphill. Now I am in flow, somewhere in my universe. Since the beginning of time, humans have been living in and evolving with nature. In fact, being surrounded by nature is in our DNA. We are wired to respond positively to the natural environments. As an architect, I design spaces that connect to that moment in nature. Here's one of my projects, McLaren Technology Center near London. The principle employed here is called biophilic design. Biophilia means the love of living systems, and it can dramatically improve the way we feel and perform in our lives. Scientists discovered genetic links that illustrate how humans have adapted their biological response mechanisms to natural environments. Several responses to natural systems are encoded in our makeup and trigger positive reactions in our physiology and psychology. That's why today, when we find ourselves in nature, we automatically feel more relaxed our molecules respond to biophilic design. Did you know that touching wood for 90 seconds lowers the release of stress hormones in our body? In a 2019 study, participants performed written tests in furniture settings with white surfaces and, as shown, wood surfaces. They found that taking tests in rooms constructed with a moderate balance of wooden surfaces can reduce our cortisol levels to 38%. Taking tests in rooms on wood surfaces affects our mood, motivation, stress, and even fear. Imagine maybe all work should be done on wood surfaces. Similarly, in that same furniture study, they found that heart rates drop significantly with wood. Imagine what a steady reduction of 5 to 10 beats per minute will do to your health. In my design for residential towers in Noida in India, we incorporated sweeping balconies and lush plantings. Beyond the presence of wood, we have observed that views of plants lower our breathing rates and our heart rates. Higher ceilings can affect and can raise our mood, and lower ceilings will depress it. In my design for a residential tower in Anyang, in South Korea, we employed similar principles. In South Korea, residential units are designed and laid out to face away from the northern border. Biophilic design affects the human body in fundamental ways. It helps regulate how your body uses carbohydrates, fats, and proteins. It can keep inflammation levels down and normalize your blood pressure. It even affects your sleep and wake cycle. Surroundings affect our physiology, our frame of mind, and our physique. As a German-American who grew up in West Germany in the 70s and 80s, I know this well. In West Germany, we had playful parks, experimental lightweight structures, such as the Munich Olympic Stadium by Frei Otto and Günther Benisch, and the Berlin Philharmonic Concert Hall by Hans Scherun, 
an organic, at the time, futuristic interpretation for the concert. However, this free-spirited culture was not accessible to our relatives who lived on the other side of the wall. As a child, and when we were able to obtain Soviet-style visas, I was shocked by the difference in feeling between the East and the West of the same country. Crossing the inner German border meant entering an opposed life construct, an oppressed culture that manifested itself in physical space and architecture. Cities were built by industry for industry. Vast new tracts of monotonous, industrially produced, all gray block housing. Since the physical space affects us so deeply, it was not surprising to see how the imposed monotony even affected the way people carried themselves physically. Research in environmental psychology consistently suggests that buildings support us best when they echo the scale and tone of the natural environment through inspiring light, form, and dimension. Philosophies and world cultures are rooted in this. The concept of biophilic design, although still new to the West, is not a new concept. 2,500 years of Eastern philosophies cherished the healing potential of nature-inspired design. For example, Buddhism embraces the concept of impermanence in philosophy and in design. Life is ever-changing, and its fleeting moments are captured in architecture. This concept of impermanence is reflected in my design for a repositioning of Intergate Manhattan, city skylines, ever-changing, always renewing. The tower sports a dynamic photovoltaic skin that picks up the changing colors of East River, Brooklyn Bridge, and Lower Manhattan a moment in time. 24 City in Chengdu in China is another good example for this. Momentary changes in natural lighting, weather, and landscaping conditions are captured in my design of Huarun Tower. The tower ground dematerializes structurally. And at the base, at the sidewalk level, the presence of the tower dissolves in a sheet of glass. Seemingly, this building becomes weightless. In Taoism, nothing is ever forced. Everything grows from within. High value is placed on equilibrium and harmony. Sometimes, growing from within is about recognizing the vernacular. I spent several years working on projects in Southeast Asia. For Lotte Center Hanoi in Vietnam, the curvilinear form of the tower is a reference to the Ao Zai, the Vietnamese long dress. In my design, we incorporated Sky Garden Atria. These light-filled multi-story atria form the central tower spine and function as community spaces for the building. This transparent central spine also then acts as a organizing element for the tower's mixed-use program. There are 14 scientifically accepted principles of biophilia. The presence of wood and views of nature are two of these. Another biophilic design principle is risk and peril. Volatility is a sensation that reminds us we are human. In my tower in Hanoi, visitors of the sky deck are drawn to the risk and the unknown when observing the city through the glass floor some 260 meters below. It's the rawness of these moments that is worth it. We feel exhilarated, even if there's an implied threat. Our bodies release dopamine and strong pleasure response. The presence of water is one more principle of biophilia we employed at McLaren Technology Center. The facility has a seamless water sheet running across the ground plane, reflecting lighting and weather conditions. 
research on response to activities in green spaces has shown that the presence of water prompts greater improvements to both self-esteem and mood than activities conducted in green spaces without the presence of water. The science of biophilia ex explains how this works. Psychology professor Dr. Vatanian studies several complex cognitive functions such as decision-making, impulse control, empathy, emotion. He found that the sight of curvilinear shapes and spaces activates regions in the brain that determine what is beautiful. Spaces are judged as beautiful when they echo nature's curved lines. Therefore, we respond positively to organic forms, such as the flowing lines of a Vietnamese long dress or the sinuous experience at McLaren. Soft materials help. However, they're not the only solution to biophilia. Materiality is another. This is my design for a 40-story hybrid tower in Seattle. All floors, beams, and columns are made with wood, so-called mass timber. Mass timber is laminated wood that is glued together or mechanically bonded for strength. In my design of Seattle Mass Timber Tower, access to natural materials is paramount. The interiors are unified by a soft, warm material palette and patterns that evoke nature. Architects create alternative worlds, wish images for what could be. Take the most utilitarian project, the crumbling and now closed West Seattle Bridge, and we can instill life, fun, and well-being into it by challenging preconceived notions of what natural materials such as wood can and cannot be used for. We can build bridges, literally. Here's my concept design, a replacement of West Seattle Bridge, a long span crossing made from wood. This bridge has a curved steel and carbon fiber truss below the drive deck that S-curves into a steel and wood composite arch above the drive deck. In 2019, this bridge carried 100,000 vehicles per day. Now imagine the positive impact on these people when crossing this new bridge enveloped by natural curves and wooden textures, day in and day out. Biophilic design is about the value of the embodied beauty of nature that we can bring to our everyday lives. We can create an identity, a sense of belonging and well-being. Currently, we're facing a climate and a health emergency. Environmental degradation continues, the risks associated to future and current pandemics remain, and an increasing world population encroaches on our ability to provide health and safety for all. Biophilic design is one way to promote healing for the environment, for our city full of busy people, and for our own personal selves. Everyday design choices, such as integrating interior plants, wooden surfaces, outside spaces with access to nature, the morning run through the park, trigger responses that allow us to perform better and feel more connected. When architects, developers, and city planners use biophilic principles, they help us create a society with innovative spaces that also inspire health, beauty, and belonging. Thank you. That was Matthias Olt. And the object that Matthias chose to represent his talk is this. It is a model of an EEG cap. He actually made this himself. Now, the cap monitors electrical activity in the brain. It helps scientists, designers, and architects understand what aspects of the surrounding environment activate those regions in our brains that determine what is beautiful, pleasing, and relaxing. Now, you may not have an EEG cap at home, but Matthias thinks it would be a fun experiment to pretend that you do. 
and then go around your environment and try to listen to what your brain is telling you, what's stressful, what's soothing, and then maybe put more wood, more light, more fresh air, more views of nature in your environment, even if it's just like a house plant, and then see if you become more healthy and more productive. It's worth a try. All right, let me put this guy here. So when I'm getting ready to write introductions for the speakers, I typically speak with them, find out a little more about them and what it is that sort of drives them and drives their particular passions. For our next speaker, Susan Long Walsh, that was a really easy thing to do. Susan is a longtime business leader and she has worked on diversity and inclusion efforts at corporations throughout the Northwest. And as to how that became her mission, her answer is simple. Because I'm a black woman, she said. Her skills and insight are in great demand now as the nation struggles to confront its long history of racial inequality. And companies are asking not just what they should say in statements, and that's the easy part, but what should they do to make their workplaces more equitable? And for her object, Susan shows this brick Here's Susan Long Walsh. How much time does it take to change a belief and a behavior? Eight minutes and 46 seconds? It took eight minutes and 46 seconds for a police officer's knee on a human being's neck to casually end his life. This horrific moment that seemed to last forever, because it was caught on video, something different, something extraordinary happened. This moment caused a global movement. Demonstrations rose from a broad coalition of solidarity and support, demanding activism and change. This moment inspired many to listen, to act, and to reflect. Because our country has a systemic and structural racism problem. Race is a part of every part of life in this country. George Floyd moved our beliefs so that we could examine more about ourselves, so that we could think about the inequality and the racism in our society and within ourselves. Beliefs are powerful. Beliefs drive behaviors. Beliefs are also tough to change. But in this moment, in this moment, the world and this movement demanded that we act differently. Social justice is not a trend. Racism is real. We need to ask ourselves, the places that we're working and shopping and perhaps volunteering, are they obliged to look at the systemic structures that occur within a culture so that they prioritize and treat all of us with dignity and respect? As employees, investors, and consumers, how are you addressing your beliefs? What are you doing about the movement? Our country is on edge, particularly in the workplace where we spend so much of our time. Society is struggling with issues of gender, inequities in income, education, wealth accumulation, and on top of it, a pandemic. Businesses are at a critical crossroads. The choices that they make today will last for 
decades. So, what do we do? Racism is going to be a part of our society unless we do something. But what do we do? We must begin to look at the structures and the systems that put us in the positions of where we don't move our societies forward, but instead we continue to keep our societies backward. Businesses have donated millions to racial equity and to civil rights organizations. Business leaders have declared that they will be anti-racist employers. Businesses large and small have put out statements that black lives matter. This is where the hard part starts. Society and environmental changes, the consumers, the investors don't want more lip service. They want change. They want to see your actions both inside your companies and outside your walls. This will be tough. This could be painful, but this is the moment that we have arrived in. Our time is now. I am black. I am a woman. And I have worked in Fortune 500 companies most of my career where I have been the only black person on the team. Additionally, attending private schools, Catholic schools in the 60s and 70s, besides me, the only other black in the room were the nuns' habits. In high school, I was the only black female all four years. I didn't choose the job that I have today that I love. I was going to be an interior designer but because of my experience being the only, I wanted to move only to all. Instead, I work with leaders to move their cultures towards one of creating a sense of belonging and fostering inclusivity for all. This is tough, but we can do this. So what did I decide to do? As a cultural change agent, because I have been involved with implementing systems that have actually started to move organizations forward, I decided to develop an action-oriented tool. Because behaviors are hard to change, and as we know, if we do nothing, those behaviors will remain the same. I call this tool the Business Report Inclusion Card, the BRIC. The BRIC is going to help support leaders and businesses moving from rhetoric to action. This will help you to be able to be graded and measured on what you are doing so that people can see exactly what you're doing because the one and done diversity workshops and the check the box activities have not been working. Society is demanding more. The brick is divided into what I call five areas of action, the five P's. Your purpose. Your purpose is what is going to define your actions to move you forward you will bring in a balanced group from all levels in your organization with diverse perspectives and diverse thoughts so that they can help to build your inclusive environment. Invest in, consciously support people of color and other marginalized groups through your philanthropy. Look at your C-suite with the extensive networks that they have and introduced your acknowledged and incredible 
marginalized groups within your own organizations to your C-suites networks. It's a win-win. Your people hire and build inclusive cultures within people who have values that are courageous, that want to be interculturally increased in their intelligence, and who are willing to always address their biases, their microaggressions, their racist behaviors, and move towards change. Make sure that you have transparent and equitable pay. Your purchasing have your business suppliers be graded and held accountable the same way you grade and hold yourself accountable. Make sure that you ask them questions and that you find out about their fair pay practices as well. When you treat your people equitably and you treat them with dignity and with respect, your losses go down and your profit goes up. Let's talk about Gen Z. Gen Z is one of the most populated generations currently at 67 million and growing. They are a third of the world's population and a quarter of the U.S. population. Gen Z, as of this year, 2020, is the most ethnically and racially diverse population in our nation's history. Gen Z is changing the workforce, and you must learn what they value in order to bring them into your workforce, because Gen Z is three times more likely to change jobs to find the culture that aligns with their values. Gen Z sees what you are doing. You want to see their pedigree? Think again. Gen Z wants to see your pedigree. Gen Z is very attuned to what is happening with race and equity within our organizations. Gen Z matters and cares about race and equity in the workplace. What does Gen Z see? They see that Fortune 500 companies have four black CEOs, just 1%. Gen Z sees that Fortune 500 companies have no black senior level executive, such as ExxonMobil, Wells Fargo, Bank of America, Apple or Microsoft. Gen Z sees that Facebook and Google have one black executive over their diversity and inclusion. Gen Z sees that this year, 2020, Amazon added its first black senior executive. What do you see in your workplace? I know what the gap looks like around me. The complexion of the power players in our country looks nothing like our country. As part of the BRIC, it will help you to assess and to measure what you are doing in your organization. It will help move you from your rhetoric to action. It will help you to bring in the Gen Z talent because it's not just about bringing in great talent, it's about retaining that talent. What will you do as an organization to bring your talent into your company so that you not only survive, but that you thrive? My goal, my dream, is to have the brick not have to exist any longer. 
because businesses are creating a community where people can bring their true selves into the workplace, do the best work of their lives, and where they can survive and thrive. It is very critical for us as a nation to be able to address and achieve racial equity. It's not going to happen overnight. This moment that lasted eight minutes and 46 seconds, it's definitely going to take longer than that. It's definitely going to take all of us being a part of moving this forward. It's not about how much time this will take. It's about what will happen if we don't try because we all have a role to play. Thank you. That was Susan Long Walsh. We asked Susan to choose an object to represent her talk, and she chose this brick. It represents the other brick that she was talking about, the business report inclusion card. That's a system that she created, which enables organizations to measure and hold leaders accountable for building a more equitable culture. She also wanted an object that has some power to it. This thing is heavy, it's dense, it can be used to build safe spaces, you can throw it and break barriers, it can keep things weighted down. And that's important to her because as a mother, she lives with a deep fear for the safety of her three now grown kids. And she also wants people to hear why as a black woman in corporate America, things must change. Okay, those are weighty ideas. So to give you a moment to process, we are going to shift to another place. It's time for some music. Not music from me, but from vocalist and violinist Joe Kai. Now, Joe is uh, someone who's born in Korea, but he was raised in Seattle, and he uses music to explore his immigrant experience. We're going back to the stage at McCall Hall for Joe's 2018 TEDx Seattle performance. Here's Joe Kai. in the tongue of a stranger everything I've heard everything I've said everything I've thought in the moment that passed us away from me passed away from you passed away from us passed the path to the swings in the back of my complex singing to the heavens bring her home Lord hear us deliver us and purchase us a Benz assigned Jesus if I could fly to you I would I wouldn't be giving up so soon don't you worry about a thing I'm here in your pocket too I dream of escaping 
escaping this madness that surrounds us confounds us leaves us astounded and doubtful of love around us when all i have to do is say hello how are you how does it feel is that so is that true for you too yes all i do may not lead to success but the days i digress i am blessed as a guest to dance with the best of us cry with the worst of us and stretch like the octopus inside of us in spite of us Every year, I'm humbled by the number of partners who join us in our mission to share great ideas. This year is no exception. I want to take a moment to acknowledge some of the partners that have made today a possibility. First up, Segway. You've heard from Segway a couple times today. Don't forget that at the end of the day, we'll be giving away a Segway 9Bot S. This was our first year working with Segway, and we had a ton of fun working with their team. Thank you, Segway, for your partnership. Uh, next up is a special shout out. Hopefully some of you were able to tune in for the women's event, TEDx Seattle Women, that happened this last week on Thursday. Uh, that event would not have happened without the support of Comcast Washington. So thank you Comcast for making that event a reality. Uh, next up, when we sat down at the beginning of this year and decided to make the pivot to virtual, we knew that it was going to be a great opportunity for us to reach out to communities that we normally wouldn't be able to connect with. Um, two partners have helped us make that vision a reality, uh, be King 5 and Crosscut. We're very appreciative of the support they've given to get the word out about today. Uh, on that same note, uh, we have a similar partner, Edelman, who's been our PR and communications partner for a number of years since the early days of TEDx Seattle. So big shout out to Edelman for all of their support and also making today a reality. Also, Edelman is manning the social accounts today, so make sure to keep them busy and tweet at TEDx Seattle. Um, something exciting happened this year. TEDx Seattle became a 501c3 designated nonprofit. Uh, which we're really excited about the doors that this will open and the opportunities it will create for our organization. This would not have been possible without the support of Lane Powell. They've been with us every step of the way providing the legal support that we, we've needed as we've grown up as an organization. 
Now, lastly, at least for now, Alaska Airlines. This is a new partnership for us this year that we're really excited about. I'm gonna let you, you all in, and this is actually the first time I've told any of our volunteers about this, but with the partnership of Alaska Airlines, we've created a volunteer scholarship program. And the way that this is going to work is once other TEDx organizations are gathering in person again, we're actually gonna take some of our volunteers and fly them across the country to go visit those other TEDx organizations, learn from them, and also share some of the great things that we've learned over the past 11 years of hosting our event. So we're really excited about that partnership. With that, we're gonna to transition to a video from Alaska Airlines talking about some of the great things that they're doing right now in these trying times. Hi, I'm Diana Burke at Rocco with Alaska Airlines. For all of us, this year has been unlike anything we could have imagined. And at Alaska Airlines, we've certainly had our share of challenges, but it doesn't change who we are at our core. To give you a sense of three priorities we're working on, one, we are relentlessly focused on safety for you and for all our employees. Second, we're working to reduce our carbon emissions, including through investing in sustainable fuels. And third, we're committed to advancing racial equity in our operation and in our communities. These issues are human and universal, and we hope you have some good conversations about them today. Well, we are about halfway through our TEDx Seattle 2020 program, and I want to thank all of you for joining us. We've heard a lot of great ideas this morning from how to become citizen scientists to different ways that intelligence can form on this earth to um, how to make our workplaces more healthy and more equitable. And we have much more coming up down the line. Um, I hope you're all doing well, but we want to pace ourselves a little bit. We're going to take a very short break Time for you to sort of relax, refocus, maybe get another cup of coffee, and uh, we'll put up something relaxing on the screen. It's the perfect time for you to uh, take the time to text us to become part of that drawing for the brand new segue at 206-312-0033. Uh, text the word WIN to that number. We're gonna announce the winner at the end of the show. And when we come back, we'll hear another story from one of our partners and we will continue our journey exploring other sides. So we'll see you in five.
So now you're here again, knocking at my door. A little too late for, I'm sorry for. The lights went out cause you kept cutting the cord. And I started to fade into your grave. See, I finally opened up my eyes. And I saw me coming back to life. And I'd be better. Starting to break out from the grave. See, I finally opened up my eyes, and I saw me coming back to life. That I'd be better without you inside. It's time to be someone I want to recognize. The future starts right now. I made a reservation, but you never came, so I'm checking. is now Ideas have the power to change the world. That's why WSCCU proudly sponsors TEDx events across Washington. My name is Will Rance. I've been with the credit union for 35 years. It's time to listen, to learn, to challenge the status quo, to ask tough questions of ourselves, each other, and our community. We need to come together with a shared purpose to rewrite rules that create inequity, to start building a better normal, not just for some, but for everyone. That's something we're invested in. We are WSCCU, the credit union for Washington since 1957. We were founded on the idea of cooperation, people helping one another. The idea that money that came from the community should go back into the community, and this would make the community grow stronger. It was a radical idea for banking, and in some ways, it still is. Not for profit, but for people. We before me. WSCCU is proud to be your neighborhood credit union. We're glad to be your neighbors. And we can do better. We can be better. Together, we can put ideas into action. Together, we can create and shape the change we want to see. The only way forward is together. Let's get started.
Welcome back to part two of TEDx Seattle 2020. We are live from Red Element Studios in Pioneer Square. And thank you again for joining us. We have been really enjoying hearing from you on social media today. Uh, we've got some of your some of your responses and some of your posts here. Uh, it's just great to hear from you and to know that you're out there and watching and enjoying the day. So I have another question to ask you. Back in 2016, TEDx Seattle sort of by chance ended up with a mascot. A person named Renee Holland, a biologist, gave a talk about finding Bigfoot. And we had a team member who had a Sasquatch costume. And so decided to just kind of walk around the lobby at the event and taking pictures with people. It was a big hit. In fact, like a surprisingly big hit. So since then, we've had a mascot, kind of an unofficial character for each TEDx Seattle. Now, this year, obviously, we don't have a lobby to walk around with in, so we didn't choose a mascot. But we want to choose a mascot for next year, for TEDx Seattle. 2021 when hopefully we will all be back together and I am going to be so excited for that to happen. So what do you want to be the mascot for TEDx Seattle 2021? Who or what do you want walking around our lobby? I can tell you our mascot is going to be celebrating big time being back together with all of you. So let us know on social media. Use our hashtag TEDx Seattle or tag us on Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook. You can even text us at 206-312-0033. Uh, what should next year's mascot be? And I cannot wait to see your answers. So there's a lot going on live in front of you right now, but there's also a lot going on behind the scenes. We have artists today who are creating art during the show, inspired by some of the themes in the show. And one of them is going to join us right now. We have dancer and choreographer Kate Wallach with us. Oh my gosh, Kate. So uh, I was going to ask you <laughs> what you've been doing, but it looks like you've been doing a lot. What's going on? I made my set. <laughs> <laughs> I actually, I was just ex uh, playing with some lighting design right now. So... <laughs> I was trying to see which color looks best for top light. <laughs> oh, cool. All right, now yeah, you so have I to explain. A, a trash pile. A trash pile, okay. And this represents, can you explain that? What life feels like right now. <laughs> Got it. I totally get it. You don't even have to say anything more. So this is like 2020. Now this is gonna be a dance though, right? So, so how does the dance interact with this, this set? Well, uh, since last time we checked in, I walked around Dance Church HQ and I uh, casted team members to help collaborate with me. Um, my sister helped with set design um, and uh, one of the dancers, who I work with all the time um, said that maybe he would participate as well. And uh, so I've been doing that. I've been trying to figure out what locations I can, I can be in and that you can sort of see movement and choreography existing in. Um, so yeah, truly it's just one big choreographic mess. <laughs> so, Kate, I, I want to ask you a little bit about your process as a choreographer. How do you create a dance? Does it start with an idea? Does it start with a movement? Does it start with a piece of music? I mean, where does that all come from in your creative brain? That's a great question. Um, usually, uh, my, my works are sparked by some sort of initiation, whether that's a uh, yearning desire deep in my soul or a commission uh, or a prompt of some sort. Um, but I, I truly think about creation existing beyond us. So once that initiation starts, um, then I start to pull together the pieces to help bring the creation to life, whether it's team members, systems, structures, forms of improvisation, um, understanding who the audience is, et cetera, to sort of bring the thing to life. 
Well, Kate, I, I can't wait to see what you end up with. So we're going to go back to you towards the end of the show, and we'll see about a minute of your final creation. Um, it'll, I'm sure it's going to be really interesting trying to move you through that space. Kate Wallach, thank you so much. We'll see you in a little bit. Bye. Thank you. Okay, so before we move on to our next speaker, I just wanted to explain what's behind me on these shelves. So um, because we're all virtual today, or mostly virtual, our speakers are on tape, and they're not here with us in the studio. So we asked them to choose objects that represent some of the ideas in their talks so that we could have something really tangible here with us. Um, and just to give you another kind of perspective on what they were thinking and saying. So some of the objects we've already introduced you to uh, earlier in the day and the other objects we will introduce you to after we hear each talk. So um, that's, what, that's, that's what that is. Okay, so our next speaker is a woman who has a profound perspective on life and living. Caroline Catlin is a writer and a photographer. She started her career working in mental health with children who had experienced severe trauma or abuse. And now that kind of work would be challenging for most people, but Caroline says she's never shied away from hard things, things that other people might find difficult or scary. Caroline believes that vulnerability is a strength and that she has forever been curious about the world of emotions, even the hard ones like grief. Here's Caroline Catlin. You know those awkward icebreaker games? When everyone goes around and answers something like, what's your favorite superpower? When I was a kid, I loved those games. I believed I had the perfect answer. People would start sharing and I would wait, bouncing in my seat with excitement. And when it was my turn, I would proudly tell everyone, the superpower I want most of all is to see people's emotions in color hovering in the air around them. Wouldn't it be cool if you could see how happy a friend was to see you? Like they'd walk in and it would just fill with the color yellow. Or you could tell when a stranger needed help, you'd pass them on the street and you'd see this long trail of blue behind them. This <laughs> was usually the moment where I would look around at the many blank faces telling me, yet again, my cool superpower it hadn't landed well with my fellow fourth graders. I was an awkward child. That hasn't really changed, and neither has my deep appreciation for the emotional world around me, or my desire to both witness and capture the elusiveness of feelings. As I grew older, I started paying attention to the people and the stories I came across, and I wrote down what I saw. When writing didn't feel like enough, I learned photography and I began documenting the moments that felt most precious to me. With a camera in hand, I learned the art of deciding what to include in the frame and what to let blur into the background. I graduated high school. I went to college. I studied a combination of psychology and art. No shortage of feelings there, I can assure you. And then I got sick. Not in a dramatic way. I didn't start screaming in agony or wake up unable to move or suddenly forget how to speak. Eventually, all those things would happen to some degree, but my path from wellness to illness was a slow, persistent movement towards deep sickness. I spent three years trying to identify the cause. I met with numerous doctors, and the answer was always the same. There was nothing wrong with me. Over and over. Despite my persistent low-grade fever and joint pain and muscle aches, I was told, go see a therapist. Practice more self-care. I started to believe they were right. Maybe nothing was wrong. Every test that came back normal had me falling further into a hole of self-doubt. 
I started grad school, hoping that I would somehow get over this mysterious illness and I could return to life as it was before. Still, there was a small, unwavering part of me that knew. Despite my symptoms not lining up with anything that made sense, I knew something was wrong. Eventually, my cognitive symptoms worsened. Brain fog and memory loss and word finding, and a doctor agreed to order an MRI, assuring me they didn't think they'd find anything concerning. Instead, they found a golf ball-sized mass in my right parietal lobe. And just like that, everything changed. I called my parents and I scheduled a date for brain surgery and I dropped out of my grad program. They told me the tumor's probably benign and with its removal that I'd likely make a full recovery. I wish with all of my heart, I could tell you they were right. I wish this story ended here. Six days after surgery, the pathology report came back telling us the tumor was not benign. It was something called an anaplastic astrocytoma. And while the surgery had been successful and the tumor was gone, the microscopic cancerous cells it left behind remained. Impossible to remove. In other words, I was officially diagnosed with a rare, aggressive, incurable brain cancer. Not my best day. My cancer is treatable, but it's highly recurrent. And when it does recur, it tends to return as terminal. The timeline of when, it's unpredictable. Some people get 15 years, some people just get one. My doctors explained to me that while chemo and radiation would reduce the likelihood of recurrence, every three months for the rest of my life, I would need to return to the hospital to check for new tumor growth. As I listened, I met real grief for the first time. I thought of that superpower I'd once wanted, and I imagined a deep, dark purple filling the room around us. A cloak of color that I knew was going to stay with me. I'm 27, I thought to myself. How can this be happening? I was as determined as I was devastated. I wanted to fight and recover, and I wanted as many years of life as possible. As I once again began to regain my strength, I started to pay attention to the people and the stories around me. In the hospital, I would push my walker down the hallway, and I would steal glances into the rooms I'd passed, and I would see these tiny worlds contained within them. Sometimes I could feel joy so big, I just wanted to stop and stand in it. Other times, the despair and the sadness made me want to run. About three months after I left the hospital, I found out about an organization that offers free photo sessions to critically ill children and their families. Right away, I called them, I set up a meeting, and I signed up to volunteer. Despite my radiation-induced fatigue and my persistent grief, the idea of giving back in that way, it lit a spark within me that had been recently extinguished. For the first time in a while, I felt hope. It was as if a thin strand of gold had begun to weave its way through my coat of grief, and the color was blending slowly into something new. This organization offers their services to children at any stage of serious illness, and often they are joy-filled and they're celebratory. Other times, a family asks for a photographer to document a child at the end of their life. Sometimes these are the only professional photos a family will ever have of their child. Often they are the last ones ever taken. The first call I got was for an end-of-life session, for a three-year-old girl who'd been very sick for a long time. She might pass while you're there, they warned me. Are you sure you're up for it? 
Yes, I told them, completely unsure if I was. Now, I could tell you about this little girl's death, which happened a few days after I photographed her. I could, but I'm not going to. Instead, I want to show you the little girl's mother, how she kissed and stroked the hair of her daughter as she lay in that too big hospital bed. Even as the world, as she knew it ended forever, she was there to give love to her daughter. I want you to see the dying girl's older brother, how he cried, but also how he took his yellow airplane and he flew it above her head. How I saw then a gesture of hope, colorful emotion, orange and gold. I want to bring you with me into the rooms where the mothers hold their babies and the families say goodbye. And I want to offer you the chance to see in frames, to choose the point of focus and blur the background, to see the details we so often miss, the moments of grace and beauty we assume don't exist in those desperate places. In the hardest moments imaginable, those families, they choose to love despite and because of it all. I was not raised in religion, and yet I can tell you, whatever you believe, those rooms are holy ground. When I was first diagnosed, I was certain grief would swallow me whole, and some days I still think it might. I will never be at peace with the fact I might not get to be a mother that I might not see my brothers get married, that I probably won't become old, like really old, the kind of old everyone else dreads and tries to fight against. I would have made a great old person. My grief, it's big. My fear of dying, of leaving behind the people I love, it's enormous. And my work photographing death has not erased that. Death itself is rarely beautiful and the images I capture reflect that too. The grief I have seen, the immensity of the loss, it's brutal. But when I walk into those rooms with that camera, my job is to do what I always wanted to do as a child, to capture the feeling and the connection and the emotion right there in front of me. And what I've learned from all these families and from my own wild terrain of grief is if I pay close enough attention, I don't need to see emotion and color after all. It's there and it's visible in the details, in the way our communities love each other through anything and everything. And with my camera, I can capture the evidence of that forever. And I can give it back to them to keep. Right now, my cancer is stable. I am so glad that for now, I get to keep living. Because that's the other side. My fear of dying, the pain of loss, it's only as strong as how much I love this life and the people in it with me. None of us are ever ready to say goodbye to the ones we love. Loss is devastating, and try as we might, we can't avoid that shattering grief that follows in its wake. My guess is, no matter who you are or what you've experienced so far, you already knew this. You too have grieved. And all of us will grieve again. And when that happens, we will have a right to be angry we can mourn as loudly as we want, and we should. But when the worst happens, we have a choice. We don't have to stay deep in the dark bitterness of loss and let that be the only thing that we see or feel. Because the one thing that's as strong and as powerful as our grief is our love 
for those who we have lost. And that love will remain like thousands of bright, colorful strands woven forever through our cloak of grief, beautiful and awful, side by side, and ours to keep. Thank you. That was Caroline Catlin. For her object, Caroline has chosen these candles. She says, candles play a role in so many celebrations and traditions. They light up our, the faces of our loved ones on birthdays. We place them in windows during the dark winter months, and we center them on our tables as we gather for dinner. When she goes home at night to start editing photos from a day's shoot, Caroline often lights a candle in honor of the child and the family that she was with that day, and she sits with it. The candle brings some light and hope into darkness and tragedy, and it also shows you that you don't need to light up a room to make a difference. Thank you, Caroline. Okay, let's take a breath and shift to another place. We're going back to McCaw Hall for a performance from last year's TEDx Seattle by Gretchen Yanover. Gretchen is a cellist and a composer whose fourth album was released just yesterday. Gretchen learned to play the cello in middle school. She says music helped her express hard emotions and gave her a place of belonging. From TEDx Seattle 2019, here's Gretchen Yanover. <laughs> Thank you. 
That was Gretchen Yanover performing at 2019's TEDx Seattle on McCall Hall. Our next speaker also makes a very large place in his life for music. When Dr. Thomas Duell was younger, he studied jazz composition and performance at the New England Conservatory of Music. That was before he went to medical school. He's now a practicing neurologist in Seattle. His patients include people who have suffered strokes or brain injuries and who lose the power of movement. Thomas has found a way to bring together medicine and music to improve their quality of life. Here's Dr. Thomas Duell. Think about the importance of music in your life. Do you play an instrument? Do you sing in the shower? Do you love to listen to your favorite music? Well, what if we could take that joy of music, whatever it is for an individual, and use it to restore function in those who are paralyzed? In college, I was a musician who really loved science. Or maybe I was a scientist who really loved music as more than just a hobby. I couldn't reconcile these two things because for the academic world, they seem like chocolate and peanut butter. They just, they don't go together. So after first declaring a major in music and music composition, I later switched to molecular biology and I continued to pursue music on the side. It just, it seemed like the practical thing to do. Then later in graduate school, I was doing a PhD in neurobiology uh, on the genetics of brain development. I continued to pursue music on the side. I played in bands and I studied music. Uh, I got a certificate in jazz at a conservatory. And for me, music was then and still is today, always will be absolutely essential for me as a way to express my emotion to the world in a way that makes sense to me. It's healing my heart and it is restorative to my mind. But again, to the academic world, it seemed to paint me as kind of a Jekyll and Hyde character or maybe Black Swan. Well, 10 years ago, uh, I was doing a neurology fellowship in surgical epilepsy. So in the laboratory, I was studying the musical processing in the brain, the electrical traces of complex sound analysis. And then in my art and music studio, I was creating an art project, which I called the encephalophone. So this was a brain computer interface that allowed people who couldn't move to play music again. So it allowed people to play music without movement from brain signal directly. Then as a neurologist, I'm in the hospital and I'm seeing stroke patients and I began noticing in some of these stroke patients a loss of not just their ability to move or their ability to speak, but a largely unrecognized loss of quality of life, a inability to play music. And for professional musicians and in even enthusiastic amateurs, this is pretty devastating. It's, it's a major loss of quality of life. And a light bulb went off my head and I said, oh, I can take this art project I have and I could use it to actually restore that quality of life for these patients, for these people. And so these parallel paths we're finally starting to merge and come together. Uh, so how does this work? How does the encephalophone work? So what we do is we measure the brain activity in a part of the brain called the motor cortex. So this is the part of the brain that tells your arms and legs to move. And we look at that activity. When you move your arm, that activity goes up. But if you think about moving your arm, what's neat is that actually has the same activity. So we can measure that when you're thinking about moving, but you don't actually have to move. 
Let's try something here to give you an example of that. I want you to close your eyes and just relax and imagine you're floating in the water and you're looking up at the clouds in the sky. So just relax and float and watch the clouds in the sky go by. You're now playing high notes on the encephalophone. So now I want you to imagine moving your right hand. Just imagine moving it, don't actually move it. Think about taking a squeeze ball and just squeeze and unsqueeze, grip and ungrip. Now you're playing the low notes on the encephalophone. So open your eyes. So what we're doing is we're measuring in that motor cortex, that part that tells your arms and legs to move. When you're relaxed, thinking of the clouds in the sky, you're getting high notes. When you're thinking of gripping and ungripping that squeeze ball, you're getting the low notes. So it's a bit challenging and awkward at first, just like any new musical instrument. But the joy it can bring to people who are empowered to play music again is just unmistakably powerful. So just to give you an example, I had a patient in the hospital, Maria. She was paralyzed from the neck down, couldn't even speak. But before all this, she was a musician. She played in bands. She wrote music, she sang, and then she got a brain tumor and multiple surgeries. And she's completely devastated, can't move, can't speak, and can't play music. So in the clinical trials in the hospital, she began using the encephalophone. And when she got to that moment when you could see that she was realizing that she was actually playing music and had control, she began to smile. She began to giggle, and she began to cry in joy at, being, at this moment where she realized, I'm playing music again for the first time in eight years. So these clinical trials that I was doing, they came out of a desire to show that the encephalophone wasn't just a, a novelty art project, but it actually worked. So in order to show that it worked, I needed to do some experiments in the laboratory. So what we first did was we took normal, healthy individuals, people without any motor disability, some of them musicians, some of them non-musicians, and we had them use the encephalophone to try to match a target note. So we gave them a, a note, and they're playing the note, doing what you were just doing a few minutes ago, relaxing, thinking of the clouds in the sky to bring the note up higher, or thinking about squeezing that squeeze ball to bring the notes down lower and they needed to try to match the note three times in a row. Well, with two different methods, we had all these people, uh, 15 subjects, all of them not only had accuracy and had real control, but they actually had much better accuracy than random. So this was really exciting. It showed that it wasn't just random notes coming out of their brain, but it was actually real control. It really worked. So now that I'd shown that it worked for Normal individuals, I wanted to show this could work for people like Maria, who had motor disability. People with stroke, people with brain hemorrhages, ALS, multiple sclerosis, spinal cord injury, amputees from military veterans, all types of people who have real motor disability. So we did the same type of experiment where we had them match the target note but these were people who couldn't even move. So not only did they match the target note with some accuracy, they actually improved over time. So over these six trials, they were able to, they were actually learning. They were learning how to do this better. So that was really exciting and satisfying. Out of all those 12 patients, one of those patients was Jonathan. So Jonathan is a brilliant computer programmer and musician who has multiple sclerosis. So his form of multiple sclerosis affected his brain stem. Not his brain, so he's completely intact in his brain, but MS has basically cut the connections between the motor cortex that I was just talking about, the part that tells your arms and legs to move. It's cut the connection between his brain and his body. So the way he describes it in his own words are, he says, I imagine the disease like a slippage, slowly losing contact I have with the physical world. 
So the scientist in me motivated me to do these experiments. I was very satisfied because I got to show that this not only worked for normal people, but it worked for people like Jonathan and Maria who actually can't move. Uh, that's really exciting, but the musician in me needed to bring this to performances. When they start performing, these individuals are no longer patients. So they become performing musicians and they're able to connect with the audience and actually be able to create music again and share that with other people. So I put on a series of concerts and one of the concerts in 2019 showed two quadriplegic musicians and one of them was Jonathan playing with a live jazz uh, ensemble. I'd like to show you a, a clip of that. So this performance brought myself and the band and the entire audience to tears. But the words that Jonathan used to describe the experience in his own words really touched me just as much. So he said, the slippage that the disease causes me to lose connection with the physical world, it's like a curtain coming down over the stage. And the performance with the encephalophone that night opened up that curtain just a little bit and allowed me to peek through and make a real connection with the audience. It was that that made it a really magical experience for me. So we've been able to show that we can re-empower people who have motor disability to play music again and perform as musicians once more. But what if we could take the encephalophone and not just allow people to play music, but we could actually get people who are paralyzed to move again. What if we could take those parts of their brain that's damaged and dormant and repair it so that they could actually start moving again? We're going to do experiments to try to show just that. So we're going to try to show if the encephalophone can make an actual therapeutic or structural difference. We'll look at motor skills improvement, see if they can move better, cognitive improvement, see if they can think better, and we'll look at rewiring through MRI sequences. So this would be looking at the wiring, seeing if those dormant parts by being stimulated can then be rewired and repaired so that someone who maybe couldn't pick up a cup of coffee or even feed themselves could do that again. So we've made these connections. We've made connections to these patients and then performers and the audience and this talk and these videos I may be able to connect to more people but I'd like to share this device with a much wider audience by making a device that would be widely available. This way someone could, anyone, anywhere who has motor disability could take the device home and they could be empowered to create music again anywhere. So why is this important? Well, it's probably pretty clear to you by now that music is very important to me, but why is music important in the world? Well, music is not just a cultural cornerstone of every society in human history. It's actually a behavior that's wired into the structure of every human being's brain. Music is not just for entertainment. It's critical in the development of the brain and for learning emotional communication. So by empowering people to play music who'd never been able to move before, it's not only empowering, but it's key to their participation in a truly full life. Thank you. That was Dr. Thomas Duell, and for his object, Thomas chose this. It is a squeeze ball. 
Remember how his encephalophone works, that you imagine squeezing your hand to lower a note and relaxing it to raise a note? Well, he often gives his patients a squeeze ball because they may not be able to move, but they can use this as a mental cue to imagine squeezing. So the reason that also that he uses the hand is that it's the largest area in the brain, so it's easiest to see those signals. So the squeeze ball can be not just a tool to strengthen your hands, but also to activate your brain or maybe even to make music. So remember we heard earlier in the day from architect Matthias Olt about how design of buildings can make us healthier, happier, and more productive? Well, we're going to hear now about how design can make our communities stronger and healthier. Rico Kirindongo is a Seattle-based architect. He is chair of the Pike Place Market Council and has been named citizen architect by the American Institute of Architects twice. Rico says he's always been passionate about art. When he was a kid, he drew all the time. And he says art was a way to make sense of himself as a black person. He also grew, grew up reading a lot of science fiction, and he particularly likes stories about how the future could be better. Rico's architecture practice in Seattle is not typical. I don't care about buildings, he told me. I care about people. And he cares about communities and, and that the built environment that nurtures them. Here's Rico Kirindongo. Ever worked in a six foot cubicle farm with overhead fluorescent lighting? Kind of like in the office, I have. You have a very different sense of well-being there than if you have open access to hang out with your peers, where you have space, view, access to nature, natural light. You feel differently, which ultimately makes you do things differently. I was born in the heart of Seattle Central District, a historically black community. My mother, who grew up in the CD, as I was called, knew that my sister and I would struggle in a neighborhood that was under-resourced. It was difficult for a black family to have a leg up. My parents wanted a better life for their kids, which meant two things. A zip code where the mean average household income was twice what it was in the CD, and access to a college track education in a public school system, the only one they were gonna be able to afford. So we moved to the suburbs. What did my parents gain for the move to white suburbia? Well, my sister and I did well in school. We both graduated college. We got well-paying professional jobs. What did my parents lose? Connection direct day-to-day -day connection with people that looked like us, cooked like us, felt the same connection as soul music, had the same way of speaking, identified with the same cultural references, had the same worldview. The apartment buildings that I grew up in on the east side felt like storage units for humans. When I walked home from school, I entered a huge asphalt parking lot with parking stalls as far as the eye could see. Rows of vinyl clad buildings that looked like oversized Lego blocks spread across the urban landscape. No differentiation, no distinction. The only way to tell my building was to find this, the six foot high letter C and then navigate myself to our family's unit C101. These cheap woody walk-ups, as they were called, three-story apartment block developments, were plentiful throughout all of suburbia. My family would reside in one for a number of years and then move on to the next one and the next one. They were entirely indistinguishable from each other, interchangeable, modern versions of affordable housing, the modern slum. This physical environment only elevated my lack of connection, my lack of sense of place. We did not know our neighbors. We had no place to gather as a family or as part of a community. 
We often had no yard, no garden, no relief from the sprawl, no beauty. I'm forever indebted to the sacrifices of my loving parents. This is not any criticism of their choices or their hopes for me and my sister. Instead, it's a reflection that environment has a profound impact on how you view and experience the world. For me, that lack of connection was fundamental in shaping who I am today, a black architect working to foster community and connection. In college, I studied architecture at a school as far away from white suburbia as I possibly could get. That community in St. Louis, what I, what I learned was that there was an even greater wage gap than where I grew up. One of those communities, the former slum of Pruitt Igo, was a classic example of the failure of urban renewal in the 1950s. The idea was that people lived in large towers and freed up the ground plain for fields of green. In practice, what Pruitt Igo really became was a failed experiment of high rise, racially segregated, poverty stricken, affordable housing. Ultimately, Pruitt Igo was torn down in the 1970s. Similar to how I grew up, those, those containers for humans did not contain environments where people felt connected to the land, to each other, or to themselves. And when you feel disconnected, it's nearly impossible to care about, maintain, or invest in the hard shell that is your container. This can easily turn into feelings of resentment, anger, fear, or neglect. It was this disconnect that I shared and felt and that drove me to authentically identify with the black, indigenous, people of color community that I wanted to serve as an architect. What I know as a community architect is that design of our built and natural environment can either tear communities apart or bring communities together. In the mid-90s, I returned to my home to create a space that would celebrate black community in the Northwest. The site was a mess, a neighborhood torn apart by a highway expansion with a long vacant school and a park that was underutilized and vacant. We started with a community visioning process to truly determine what mattered to the community that we wanted to serve. Now, more than a decade after it opened, the Northwest African American Museum at the Coleman School is still going strong. It has served to knit the community together and create a space where people belong. Physical space can unlock pride. Another project that brought together community was First Place Schools in Seattle. They served homeless kids and in doing so, providing them education and providing them a safe space that they otherwise didn't have. I had the opportunity to design an environment to provide the things that I was not otherwise afforded in suburbia. In the central district, my parents knew their neighbors. They could hang out on the front yard. They could sit on a stoop and talk. This place needed to promote community. It started with a small housing development called Amani Village. It was built immediately adjacent to the school. It provided outdoor classroom space for the school and 16 units of affordable housing uh, for families that were a part of the program. In her famous book, The Death and Life of Great American Cities, Jane Jacobs talks about how when people have windows that look out onto the street and onto shared outdoor space, they're more likely to look out on their windows and be a part of keeping the street safe. We designed this project to make certain that we created that same experience. The project was designed to look like two large residential homes. People moved from the unprotected space of the street through a portal uh, between the two homes and into a shared courtyard populated with flowering trees, adorned stoops, and play equipment for the kids. Each unit's entry and windows look into that shared space and people have a shared experience that allows them to build community, allows people to co-mingle and get to know their neighbors. 
In doing so, we created a sense of home. When built spaces ignore community, the cost is high. Two years ago, I was asked by a majority white developer to assist them with a project that they had lost their way. Their goal was to develop 430 units of uh, residential housing on a prominent street in the Central District. Two other projects of a similar type had already failed the black community on that same intersection. The developer did not understand the community's values. The project was not being developed in a way that was celebrating black culture and history. The black community decided that enough was enough and that this white developer was coming into their community and taking advantage of them. The city of Seattle responded by saying that the developer could not move forward with the project until this disconnection was addressed. I was brought in to help reestablish the conversation and invite more faces to the table. The difference between involving the community from the start and coming in late was that we still had big boxes on the site. However, we were able to incorporate eight black artists into both the design of the physical buildings and the site. And through that collaboration between the black artists and the developer, we are able to now see and celebrate the brilliant black history and culture of the Central District literally cast on the buildings uh, of this project. The project includes a courtyard internal to the city block, which features a huge outdoor gathering and performance space with a beautiful life-giving tree as the centerpiece. The space will be given life by African-American marketplace, small businesses, retail, and art galleries that populate all of the spaces that wrap the courtyard and also spill out onto the street. In partnership with Africatown Community Land Trust, the city block will offer almost 250 units of affordable housing for families. Last summer in a neighborhood in Seattle, there was a single space that embodied community and a need to heal. Capitol Hill was overtaken by unrest. The Capitol Hill organized protest or CHOP as it came to be known, came together to celebrate culture and have their voices heard. Cal Anderson Park, was transformed by the Black Lives Matter movement and a groundswell of community members engaged. They wanted to make a difference for themselves, by themselves, despite hardship. After the dust settled and the shop, and the shop was no longer occupying the city streets, we convened a series of public open houses, online surveys, and small gatherings to ask stakeholders at every level how we create own and occupy public space. Marcus Henderson of Black Star Farmers built a community garden in that public space of the CHOP because people crave connection to each other and to the earth. He answered that call by creating opportunities for families to plant vegetables and grow their own food to be more connected to both the soil and to be able to commune with each other. By re-envisioning the physical environment in the public realm, Marcus created community. We're expanding on that promise by creating new gathering spaces for community conversations, public art opportunities, and expanding the opportunities for food producing garden spaces on the site. We'll enhance the public realm with clear and open lines of sight, better lighting, and community policing that will allow neighbors to feel safe to gather and to celebrate the culture of their community. All humans have a right and responsibility to invest in their, in their built environment to promote social change. Imagine what would happen if we all had our own version of Cal Anderson Park. Architecture is an expression of who we are as a culture, what we hold up on high as beauty, what we believe is important to invest in, and how we treat our people. Without holding ourselves responsible for that personal investment in our own future and that of our community, 
We will continue to erode the social structure that have supported our sense of well-being. We will not nurture our cultural center, our sense of place, our sense of home, our sense of connection. The built environment, not just the buildings, but the way buildings are designed to create open and gathering space, can provide a stronger connection between the community that lives there by celebrating history and celebrating the culture of the people that live there. In this way, we can create a, a renewed sense of connection and celebration. I've seen it happen, but architects alone are not the answer. From public officials, down to small business owners, down to residents, everyone needs to participate in the process to celebrate and come together to create a space where we can all belong. Right now, we're a nation disconnected from ourselves, from each other. We need to come together to create spaces where we can be together and feel a sense of belonging, both psychologically and physically. Thank you. That was Rico Kirindongo. We asked Rico to choose an object that we could have on set to represent his talk, and he chose this megaphone. Because he says part of building better communities is making sure that people who live there have a voice. So Rico wants people to speak up through the power of your lived experience. He says you can help shape the built environment where you live, work, or congregate. The megaphone gives voice, amplifies meaning, and calls others to action. So we will be right back with another short profile from our partner, WSECU. Ideas have the power to change the world. That's why WSCCU proudly sponsors TEDx events across Washington. My name is Will Rance. I've been with the credit union for 35 years. It's time to listen, to learn, to challenge the status quo, to ask tough questions of ourselves, each other, and our community. We need to come together with a shared purpose to rewrite rules that create inequity, to start building a better normal, not just for some, but for everyone. That's something we're invested in. We are WSECU, the credit union for Washington since 1957. We were founded on the idea of cooperation, people helping one another. The idea that money that came from the community should go back into the community, and this would make the community grow stronger. It was a radical idea for banking, and in some ways, it still is. Not for profit, but for people. We before me. WSCCU is proud to be your neighborhood credit union. We're glad to be your neighbors. And we can do better. We can be better. Together, we can put ideas into action. Together, we can create and shape the change we want to see. The only way forward is together. Let's get started. Our next speaker is Jody Ann Bury. She is a writer, the creator and host of the podcast Black Cancer, and a self-described disruptor of business as usual. Jody Anns is a familiar voice leading and curating conversations in our community around racism and social change. Her work centers around the experiences of those who have been marginalized across our history and culture. Jody Ann has a cherished tattoo image, uh, image ta tattooed on her wrist. It's an Adinkra symbol called Sankofa, which is a mystical bird that flies forward with its head turned back. It originates in West Africa, and it symbolizes the work of keeping your past with you as you move forward. It also is a reminder that you can always turn behind you to get what was left behind. Jody Ann says that in workplaces, people of color often pay a price to be their authentic selves. What she hopes is that they can create new spaces to be exactly who they are. Here's Jody Ann Bury.
So picture this. Your friend calls to invite you to a party this Saturday. They say, yes, I totally understand that Saturday is Halloween, but trust me, it's not a Halloween party. October 31st just happens to be the best day when everyone is in town. No, 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 no. You don't have to wear a costume. It's not gonna be like that at all. Just come as you are. A party with your friends on Halloween without having to go through all the trouble of finding a costume. A costume, mind you, you'll never wear again. Oh, you'll be there. So Saturday is here. You head on over in your favorite faded jeans and the stylish enough top, quite frankly, you've been lounging in all day. You knock on the door. Out steps these bright red boots, the perfect accessory to your friend's Wonder Woman costume. Wonder is the exact description of the look on your face. As you enter the house, your eyes dart across a number of cartoon characters, uniformed professionals, and some unfortunate impersonations of the latest celebrities. You look to your friend for answers, but they're gathering the final votes for the costume contest. A costume contest. You, of course, receive no votes. Do you feel that? That feeling that you have right now? The anxiety, the upset, and bewilderment as to how you came to be the odd one out for just doing what you were told to come as you are. That's exactly how I feel when I am told to bring my full authentic self to work. We want people of color to feel like they belong here, they say. We're looking for passionate people who can bring a fresh perspective to challenge our way of thinking, they say. Our diversity is our strength, they say. Come just as you are, they say. Recruiters, managers, executives, CEOs, all those responsible for making decisions. They say quite a lot <laughs> and perhaps for good reason. It's long been the expectation for people like me who have been grossly, often intentionally underrepresented at work to contort ourselves into this caricature of what some call professionalism and what we call a distorted elaboration of white cultural norms and the standards that meet the comforts of those who hold social and institutional power. That's professionalism. The invitation to bring our full authentic selves to work signals that this place could be the place to safely shed the guise. We could collect the parts of ourselves we've compartmentalized and trust that our differences will be seen as assets, not liabilities. Seated in this call for authenticity is this idea that those who don't have to spend all their energy hiding parts of themselves could find more fulfillment at work. The expectation is that the more we could just be ourselves, perhaps, just maybe, others will follow suit. The hope is that soon enough, the culture of the entire organization will shift, becoming more inclusive and welcoming of difference. My type of difference. So I show up to work as I am with my Afro, my family photos, my disability accommodation needs, my questions, my pushback, my perspective grounded in the lived experience of all my identities. I show up with this full, authentic self to perform my job with excellence. But when the time comes for the stretch projects, the promotion, equal pay, recognition, mentors, sponsors, I'm overlooked. You need to work on being more of a team player, they say. Your approach makes it difficult to work with you, they say. Try to help others feel more comfortable around you, they say. You are hurting your relationships at work 
when you talk about racism. They say, no promotion, no mentor, no votes. We cannot compete in the costume contest without a costume and expect to win. The call to brave work with more authenticity undeservedly disadvantages people of color. Those of us who are already burdened with the task of chronically battling bias. With precision, the work to shift culture is designed to cost us our own mental and physical health. If who we are makes us as difficult, as they say, then this demand for our authenticity compromises our careers. Listen, the fact is this, one person or even a few people coming just as we are cannot change company culture. How would change happen alongside rewards for coded definitions of fit? What difference would it make to allege a value for diversity without sustaining evidence of that value in any meaningful way? We know what we're up against. Authenticity has become a palatable proxy to mask the pressing need to end the racism ageism, ableism, sexism, homophobia, xenophobia, and the like that run rampant throughout our professional lives. Without accountability to examine these systems of bias and power, the call for authenticity fails. It fails to question who is in the room, who sits at that table, and who gets to be heard. It fails to demand that we reveal the truth about how racism impacts decisions about who's in the room, who sits at that table, and who gets to be heard. What many people of color find is that even when we are in the room, sitting at that table, stating firmly, I am speaking, very few people are actually listening. It can start to feel like, like our bodies are wanted in the room, but not our voices. Look, I know what that's like. A couple years ago, at the end of a senior leadership brainstorming meeting, I was called into an unscheduled check-in with an executive. She sounded enthusiastic about how my contributions helped move the project forward, so it surprised me when she then suggested that in future meetings, I should try to be more agreeable to help give others a win. If I did have feedback, she advised that I send it over email instead. Honestly, I was taken aback. Like here I was feeling like my contributions mattered, that my seat at that table had proved pivotal to the success of our work together. Excitedly, I felt a lightness, ideating alongside my colleagues without reserve. The work was riveting, so I opted outside of my usual guardedness. I stopped hiding my opinions. I worried less about those constricted norms of how I should express myself. For the first time, I felt like, like I could take off that costume so many of us have to wear. Clearly, that was a mistake. <laughs> At the end of her comments, I tried to keep it real with her. I said, your advice is consistent with the way women of color, black women especially, are treated at work. Her response fit perfectly into this three-step framework I've now come to know as DARVO. Deny, attack, reverse the victim with the offender. DARVO sounds like this. <clears throat> Jodi Ann, this has nothing to do with your race. Deny. You're just being too sensitive and angry. Attack. You know, 
if you're going to play the race card, every time I try to give you feedback, it's going to make it really hard for us to work together. I just want you to be successful here. I'm just trying to support you. Who's the victim now? Her attempts to gaslight me, to psychologically manipulate me into questioning my own reality was futile. Even then, in that moment, I knew that my experience was not unique. For too many black women and other people of color, people living with disabilities, non-binary people, deaf people, LGBTQIA plus people, and others among us that are constantly featured on the come work with us section on company websites. We know this harsh reality intimately. Being authentic privileges those already part of the dominant culture. It is much easier to be who you are when who you are is all around you. Coming just as we are when we're the first, the only, the different, or one of the few can prove too risky. So we wear the costume. We keep the truer parts of ourselves hidden. We straighten our curly hair for interviews. We pick up hobbies we do not enjoy. We restate our directives as optional suggestions. We talk about the weather instead of police brutality. We mourn for Breonna Taylor alone. We ignore the racist comments our supervisor makes. We stop correcting our mispronounced names. We ask fewer questions. We learn to say nothing and smile. We omit parts of our stories. We erase parts of ourselves. Our histories and present realities show this to be the best path for success. But now our society is reaching a new tipping point. Inequities, racism, and bigotry are finding fewer places to cower. Silences are becoming harder to keep. Our most radical collective imaginations for racial justice are reaching new possibilities. And so I'm asking that we, the people who have and continue to be denied inclusion in that refrain, dedicate the authentic fullness of who we are to that work, the work of making space everywhere for who we are to breathe. But just for a moment, let me step away from that work to tell the rest of you this. Black people do not need to be any more authentic. So no, this black disabled immigrant woman will not be bringing her full authentic self to work. But she is asking that you, those of you with the power of your positions and the protection of your whiteness and other societal privileges you did not earn to take on that risk instead. There's an opportunity in this movement for change for you to do just that, change. Not your hearts and minds, close the gap between what you say and how we're treated. Change your decisions. Make working effectively across racial and cultural differences a core competency in hiring and performance management for everyone. Define good product design as one that centers the most underserved people. Close the racial gender pay gap, starting first with Latinx women. Build responsive people systems to manage racial conflict with equity and justice. These aren't the decisions that shift culture, but rather a tiny sample of the expansive possibilities of what you can actually do today in your next meeting to realize the hope for racial equity. 
you do the work to make it safe for me to come just as I am with my full authentic self. That's your job, not mine. It's your party, not mine. You set the rules and rewards. So I'm asking you, what will it take to win in your contest? Thank you. That was Jody Ann Bury. And for her object, Jody, Jody Ann chose this blank journal. It symbolizes the work that people of color still have to do to chart our own paths and write our own stories. And she added this poem to the journal. It's by Lucille Clifton, and it's called, Won't You Celebrate With Me? Won't you celebrate with me what I have shaped into a kind of life? I had no model. Born in Babylon, both non-white and woman, what else did I see to be except myself? I made it up here on this bridge between starshine and clay, my one hand holding tight my other hand. Come celebrate with me that every day something has tried to kill me and has failed. Powerful words by Lucille Clifton. So back in the spring, when Washington state locked down because of COVID-19, a lot of people were suddenly thrown out of work. And that included many artists as theaters, concert halls, and other performance venues were shut down. At the Pacific Northwest Ballet, Leah Tarada and Miles Pirtle went searching for places where dancers could safely perform. They created a dance that takes place in living rooms, in backyards, and in the scenescapes of Seattle. Rehearsals happened over Zoom, and some of the video was shot on iPhones. The piece they co-created is called Happening, and it's performed by dancers from the Pacific Northwest Ballet. Thank uh -huh. 
That was so cool. Well, PNB is just beginning its new season. It will be entirely digital. And this year's theme is Dance Happens Everywhere. So earlier in the show, we asked you to help us choose a mascot for TEDx Seattle 2021. And we heard from a lot of you. We've got some great answers. Um, here are some of the ideas that we got. Uh, I've pulled out a few of them. The mascot should be an eagle to represent strength, unity, and peace among all in this nation. And it's also seen here in the beautiful Pacific Northwest. Um, we have next year's mascot should be a social butterfly. We hope that would be a great one. Uh, I vote for octopus for next year's TEDx Seattle. That likely is uh, inspired by our uh, talk we had today about the octopus. We actually got a couple of octopus votes. We also must have some hockey fans because several of you voted for a Kraken. And uh, the TEDx Seattle could be a peacock symbolizing awakening, beauty, immortality, self-expression, integrity, and love. And finally, this is my favorite, a phoenix rising from the ashes of 2020. We love these ideas. Please keep them coming on social media. Tag us or use the hashtag TEDxSeattle. It has been so interesting to see over the past several months what's going on in people's outdoor spaces, like their gardens or their backyards or even their window boxes. A lot of people grew food this summer and maybe it was just a pandemic hobby for some people, but for others like me, it felt almost like this instinctual need when you're faced with a threat, you just wanna get into the dirt and grow things. But even if it's instinctual, it's not easy, and it's given a lot of city people like me a new appreciation for the people who grow our food. So our next speaker, Audra Mulkern, used to be a city person as well. She worked at Microsoft doing program management and business development for gaming. And when she had kids, she moved out to Duval, Washington, where she started thinking more about food and what she feeds her kids. And it was really what she saw in her community that led her to become an advocate for a specific kind of farmer. Uh, and she chose radicchio for her speaker object. Here's Audra Mulkern. Eight years ago, I was shopping at my local farmer's market when I stopped and took a step back out of the busy corridor that was just bursting with fresh produce. I wanted to take it all in. This beautiful but temporary art gallery that just springs up in the middle of a street every week. As I watch people buzz around from stand to stand, I notice something. Behind every single farm table was a woman. Now I knew women farmed. Many of them were my friends and neighbors, but there was something different about that day, about that moment. I replayed it over and over. Why had they suddenly become visible to me? Had women farmers just recently shown up on the scene or had they always been there? So I went to the library to figure it out. 
And what I learned is that women farmers are missing from the narrative, from the data, from the picture. It wasn't until the 1978 Census of Agriculture that the USDA even began to track gender. So up until 40 years ago, women farmers were not even counted. And when I did find women in books or magazine articles, they were farmers' wives or daughters, often without a story of their own. I began to ask, what happens when women go uncounted, when they're left out of the story, when they're not even in the picture? That began my journey. I borrowed a camera from a friend. She showed me how to use it. And I set out to learn to how to take pictures. But I didn't want to just take portraits. I wanted to capture what I couldn't find at the library, female farmers farming. I have photographed and visited hundreds of female farmers across the country as they've driven tractors, mucked stalls, and tended seedlings. I hoped my photographs would make them feel seen. But I also wanted everyone else, little girls, consumers, even policymakers, to really see these farmers, to put their lives and realities and challenges back in the picture. So why photos? We can look at pie charts all day long, but until we see the faces and hands of these farmers, the story of American agriculture is incomplete. We all know this guy, right? He's the stereotype of the American farmer. He's part of the Americana lore of red barns and green tractors. But Anastasia looks different from that guy. And she farms differently too. She lives alone on a ranch in southern Arizona where she raises goats and grows garlic. I visited on a June day when the temperatures reached 110 degrees. That desert terrain is tough, but so is she. Down the road from Anastasia lived Joe. 30 years ago, she and her husband George opened a butcher shop and it became the go-to facility for neighboring farmers. After George passed away, Joe closed the shop, but when she met Anastasia, they began to dream about reopening together. However, on the very day I visited, Joe's well went dry for the first time ever. And without funding to drill a deeper well, these two women were forced to abandon their plans. For Joe and Anastasia, that loss was personal. Their story illustrates the fact that women have a harder time obtaining loans and credit. For the community, this loss reverberates. Fewer meat processing options. Another local business lost. And a missed opportunity to transfer all of that skill and knowledge from one generation to the next. Idzai immigrated from her native Zimbabwe in 2002 with her husband and four daughters. Her first order of business was to find land to farm and a good school for her girls. She got started on a 30 by 40 foot garden plot and now she leases the backyards of four different homes in downtown San Diego. She turns these urban yards into lush, productive, life-giving spaces. Idzai's days begin at 4 a.m. when she works an eight-hour shift as an airport shuttle driver. And then she works the rest of the day on the farm. Her dream is to farm full time, but for now she relies on the steady income of the shuttle job. And she's not alone. Two thirds of America's female farmers have a full time job in addition to their farm. And not just for the extra income, but for health care benefits. The challenges that female farmers face will feel familiar to many of us. Siri is a vegetable farmer here in Washington State. 14 years ago, she left a salary job in public administration to start farming, a decision she doesn't regret. 
She says that farming is a good life, but the profit margins are thin and the hours erratic. I took this photograph of Siri years ago when she was pregnant with her second child and now with two young children. Lack of access to childcare remains a major hurdle to building up her farm business. In fact, childcare comes up repeatedly as I speak to women farmers. A 2015 study in the University of Vermont told us that over 60% of all farmers surveyed reported childcare problems. And it should come as no surprise that women-led farms were most impacted. Siri cobbles together several part-time fixes to the childcare problem, but it isn't enough. And she yearns for the time to focus on business development and to advocate for informed farm policy. All of that gets lost in the scramble. I said earlier that I had a hard time finding the stories of women farmers in my research at the library. And so I've had to dig deeper to unearth their stories. I've been poring over the journals of a farm woman who lived in Ohio in the early 1900s. Her name was Lucy Cox. Her journals were sent to me by her great granddaughter who transcribed Lucy's days during the pandemic of 1918. Every day, Lucy would document the births and deaths, illnesses and anniversaries in her community, all while preparing the hogs for sale and managing farm hands and preserving food for the winter. But the flu pandemic of that time was not the only crisis happening. There was a storm of crises. As men left to go fight in World War I, women were recruited to take over their work. Maybe you've heard of Rosie the Riveter, the symbol for the women who worked in factories during World War II. But have you heard of the farmerettes of the Women's Land Army? In both world wars, young women left everything to live and work on farms. Together, they fed a nation at war. Since then, I have found farm women stepping into leadership and activist roles. In the 1950s, Maria Moreno, a Texas-born farm worker and mother of 12, was the first woman hired to organize farm workers. She worked on campaigns to raise farm worker wages and outlaw child agricultural labor. During the 1980s farm crisis, when farm foreclosures were forcing millions off their land and farmer suicide rates were skyrocketing, it was farm women like Mona Lee Brock who became advocates. And not only did they rally in Washington, D.C. to stop those farm foreclosures, but they organized regional telephone networks to answer the calls of farmers who are on the brink of giving up, not only on the land, but on themselves. Something else about female farmers. I noticed that their operations tend to be a little more polyculture in nature vegetable, maybe some fruit, small livestock like chickens and goats. They scale up slowly, building their businesses around direct markets, avoiding middlemen and the export economy. Instead of bank loans, many rely on crowdfunding and community support. I wondered why women seem to be attracted to this type of agriculture. And then Dr. Pilgrim, a researcher at the University of Idaho, suggested to me that I was asking the wrong question. What if, instead of being attracted to it, they were recreating it? What if these women, locked out of modern lending and farm systems, were tapping into something very old, something that echoed the agriculture of our foremothers? while also innovating through technology and markets to meet the current moment. During the spring of 2020, when the food system at large buckled due to COVID-19, creating log jams in meat processing and harvesting, record numbers of consumers turned to these small and regional farms for food. While many large farms had to make devastating decisions, like to dump milk and plow under their crops, it was 
smaller farms, many of them led by women, that were able to be more agile, pivoting overnight from restaurant sales to virtual farm stands. I saw women across the food system working tirelessly to find solutions. Like Sophia Pastor, who worked to rescue and redirect over 10 million pounds of crops like potatoes and onions from Eastern Washington farms to Western Washington food banks. In the South Bronx, Karen Washington hosted free farmers markets, giving away tons of fresh produce. Once again, in a crisis, women came together to feed a nation. But what if, instead of turning to women just in times of crisis, we had supported and funded them long before? What would our communities look like if Anastasia had taken over the butcher shop, or Idzai could quit her shuttle job, or Siri had time to strategize and lead farm policy efforts. In hobbling these women, we have hobbled ourselves. Globally, we face serious agricultural challenges. How do we feed a growing population on an increasingly arid planet? How do we pandemic-proof our food systems? How do we prevent farmland from being lost to development? And how do we create a food system that pays our farmers fairly for their product? These are gigantic problems. And to find solutions, we need the creativity and leadership of women. Throughout history, women show up during crisis. We feed our communities. We pick up shovels and picket signs, and we go to work. In Anastasia, Idzai, and Siri, I see glimmers of Lucy on her farm in Ohio, Maria in California, Mona Lee in Oklahoma, and the Farmerettes. When woven together, their stories create the quilt of American agriculture, past and present. You've heard of the glass ceiling, the metaphor for the barriers that women in business and politics face. These barriers exist for women in agriculture too. I call it the grass ceiling. And this grass ceiling harms not only women farmers, but all of us who care about the future of food in this country. Women farmers need enthusiastic, loyal customers but they also need tireless advocates. They need policies that address the very real systemic issues that keep women farmers from accessing land and growing their businesses. We need to fund women farmers by designing more inclusive financial models. And we need better data. Women farmers deserve to be recognized counted and seen. It has been quite a journey from that day in the farmer's market to here today. And it's been my honor to be on the other side of the camera lens, putting women farmers back in the picture, helping you to see them too. But there is more work to do. It is time to mow that grass ceiling down. Thank you. Sorry, I forgot to take off my mask. Well, that was Audra Mulkern. And for her object, she chose this lovely head of radicchio, which is also called red chicory. Um, it was grown by Siri, the farmer we just met. Now, radicchio is a very hardy crop. It grows in cold temperatures and can tolerate frost. So Audra says that makes it a great symbol of resilience which is appropriate for Siri. She lives in a place that floods several times a year sometimes, so she keeps on going. Now, Audra also says that Siri is an evangelist for, chick for chicories and radicchio and other kinds of chicories. She wants to make Puget Sound famous for its radicchio and chicories, sort of like we're famous for our salmon and coffee. 
So be on the lookout for radicchio next time you are at your farmer's market. And that goes there. So during the show, we have had artists hard at work behind the scenes making art. And we want to go to them for the final reveal. We're going to see what they have come up with during TEDx Seattle 2020. Let's go first to our artists, Barry Johnson and Moses Sun. Whoa, okay, that is amazing. Um, <laughs> Barry, how are you doing? I mean, it, you're do, obviously doing great. That looks beautiful. How's it going? It's really, really, really good. Um, it's been such an amazing day. Moses has created something that is nothing short of phenomenal okay. in this time. <laughs> and I'm just so blown away by what he's created. I'm gonna let him do the rest from here because it's all him. Yeah, um, Moses, maybe. tell us tell us about it. I know this was kind of just you were just gonna sort of improvise this. What uh, what was going through your head and what did you create? Well the the theme itself, the other side, you know uh, and the other side are many things uh, to me. And so as you can see, there's like the blue, the yellow, the greens, the oranges, the pinks. Um, they all represent different things to me in the moment. Um, the overall landscape that you see, you know, behind me really indicates that there's this, there's a vast amount of experiences and things that we all go through that we can actually share. Um, be it the pandemic, be it missing our friends and family, be it that just that little bit of respite we get when we may happen to be driving and, and see a mural or something like that, or just see a piece of art just in the making. All those things contribute to the overall um, thought that was behind this. And so, um, you know, that's really what it's about for me is just taking the moment and making the most of it. When I first saw it in a wide shot like that, it looked almost like a dragon to me. I spent a lot of time in Asia, so maybe that's why. Is, it, is there any kind of dragon motif or is it just what I'm seeing? It's just what you see. Yeah. And that's the beauty of the work that, a lot of the work that I do is that I really am about like all, all diasporas. Um, and I've, I've always been able to rely on those diasporas, African, um, Southern, Black, uh, Asian, Latino, Latinx, Latinx, um, when I really just needed to be held, whenever I needed to just get some some uh, respite from the kind of like world we live in sometimes. I go to music, I go to food, I go to all those things, and that's what you see showing up here. Now, I know this represents 2020 for you, which I think for a lot of people was a really hard year Right, but when I look at that image, it's so beautiful and so intricate. Um, is that the feeling that you're trying to get across? Or is it just that when you look at things a certain way, they look beautiful? Really the viewer. It's really up to the viewer. Like I, I have in mind like maybe a few things emotionally that are going on with me, but this is my way to translate a lot of the, the struggle, the pain, the bad news, um, the fake news, whatever you want to call it, and translate it into something that can be, people can enter and enjoy and bring their own culture to. Their own culture, their own experiences, all of that. This is my dinner table. This is my dinner party. You know, That's and so, and also it being on black, you know, and, and, you know, you're saying like you feel like joy or happiness or you, it's, it's something kind of cool to feel. It's just, you know, you're, you can get lost in it. And it being on black paper, especially now after the election and everything is really significant because that's the thing about black culture is that we reinvent and we figure out a way to celebrate even in, in, in times that you wouldn't think you could. And right. that's the condition of black human American, like that is a very black American experience. Not to say it's not African or, or, or others, but yeah. Yeah, Moses son, that is amazing, truly amazing. Thank you so much for sharing it. Stand by.
because we're going to go over to Kate Wallach and see what she has come up with. I know she's going to do a little bit uh, of the dance that she's created. I wanted to set the scene, though, a little bit because we saw earlier on uh, the, that she'd taken her bedroom and sort of made it into this giant junk pile, which represented 2020 for her. So let's go over to Kate. We're going to hear some music and we're going to see the first minute or so of her dance. Hey, that was so beautiful. <laughs> Are you still there? Can you hear me? That was so gorgeous. Hi. Hi. Hi that was really beautiful. My um, sorry, I need to put my headset back in. Um, that was really cool. And I, I wasn't sure what to expect after seeing the stage that you had set earlier in the show. The stage is 2020 and it was a mess, but the, the dance was really lyrical and beautiful. Can you tell us a little bit about the process that went into creating that dance and what you were trying to say in those movements? Absolutely. Um, I improvise a lot um, in my life, in the dance studio, in situations, day to day. And so when I have the context, when I have the scene, it's easy for me to try to stay present and navigate through through the tangle and the spider web. <laughs> and so um, I tried to tangle myself through there since mm -hmm. the last break, but then everything started like crumbling. <laughs> so so that it was like maybe maybe I can just engage from you know the outskirts a little bit. Um, but yeah. That's kind of how I approach improvisation. That's how I approach creation. I wanted to create a bit of calm and sort of sustainability and presence alongside this scene. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to ask you the same question I asked Moses, which is that, you know, your work represents 2020, which, you know, for most of us has been a dumpster fire. And yet it really was so, so beautiful. Is that a statement of you know, that we can overcome it? Or, you know, I guess I expect you to come out and just be making hacking motions at your pile, but, but you didn't do that. So why'd you make that, that choice? I, I like connecting with grace. My, my natural instinct is to connect with fire. Um, but I, I think that that's one of the reasons why my medium is dance and the body is because I've been able to, you know, 
find portals and channel different energy to um, to not necessarily always reflect the environment in which we're living in. We live in that. So, so for me, art is a way to to sort of reflect that and to um, take what's happening around us in, but also as a way to remove yourself from what you're in every day. I think that is very um, wise advice, like for every day of our lives these days. Kate Wallach, thank you so much for doing this. It was really fun to see you share your work and uh, so interesting to watch your process. We'll post the final works by Kate Wallach Barry Johnson and Moses' son on our website, TEDxSeattle.com. That'll be up in the coming days. We'll also have links to their other work as well as to Barry's 2018 TEDx Seattle talk. Thank you all for being a part of TEDx Seattle. So our final speaker today is artist Richard Rhodes. Now Richard is well known for his stone sculpture, but it was really happenstance that led him into that field. He was in London pursuing graduate work in theater when he decided to do his thesis on ritualized male behavior in medieval drama. Now that led him to Italy, to a seven century old stonemasons guild, but rather than study it, he decided to join it and become an apprentice to the stonemakers. Eventually, he returned to the United States to take up his acting career, but he realized that the world of stone had captured his imagination. And he's going to tell you why. Here's Richard Rhodes. I'm a stone sculptor. I work mostly with granite, using the traditional tools of the trade, the hammer and the chisel. It's an ancient motion, one of mankind's first, and unchanged since we started to alter our world around us. When I make this motion, I can feel the muscle memory in my body. It resonates beyond this time, beyond the present. And after decades of carving, I still experience that sense of timelessness each time I pick up the tools. I measure my sculpture progress in seasons and years. The work takes real time. Stone is hard and the process is physical. It's slow and can sometimes feel grinding. But rather than be discouraged by the slow progress I seem to be making, I have come to relish the iterative empirical process it requires. Slowing down and turning inward has helped talk me out of any number of bad ideas. It's given me time to ask the hard questions, sometimes waiting years for the answer. It's also given me courage to tackle the big themes and work on them over long arcs of time. David Brooks, in his book, Road to Character, says that one should always have a permanent commitment to tasks that cannot be completed in a single lifetime. A single lifetime seems about right, since Stone reminds me every day through its resistance and its unyielding permanence that the things worth doing take real time. Let me offer a few examples. This sculpture contains 550 tons of granite. That's the equivalent weight of 250 small trucks. It's one of four forms that divide the rooms of a large residence. Some of the blocks measure 9 feet by 12 feet. That's the scale of an apartment bedroom. This took four years to hand carve and install. One of my latest works, the Resolute Arch, took eight years to solve the engineering, build the prototype, and hand carve the granite. This work is on a civic scale, and one could easily drive a fire truck under it. 
When the stone carvers built the great cathedrals of Europe, it was not uncommon to spend 20 years on the foundation. Imagine spending your entire working life on a foundation that no one will ever see. Talk about delayed gratification. Masons spent their entire working lives on these projects over hundreds of years. Meaning and life purpose arose naturally from slow, sustained contribution, from the rush of setting a single stone into what I call a position of certainty. Once placed properly, stone stays put, maybe for a millennium, maybe forever. The fact that the task was hard, took real time and effort, is certainly part of it. But there's also something about leaving the world a little better, a little more beautiful than when I found it. Whatever it is, I feel that I'm part of that sustained contribution each time I finish a sculpture and place it on the ground. These days, we often look to technology to save us time. Technology seems to offer us shortcuts or life hacks. I am often asked, why do you still carve by hand when we can cut by computer or scan and squirt in 3D? Indeed, why talk to a person when I can text or simply swipe and like? Working in stone has made the reasons crystal clear to me. If I have done my work as an artist, over the decades I have built thick neurologic cables between my heart and my hands. Using these simple ancient tools, what I feel is conveyed directly into my carving. In my hands, the hammer and chisel offer me an unmediated connection. There's nothing standing between what I feel and the material. With modern technologies, I'm, I'm several steps removed from the work. They can offer me a type of translation. But in the end, technology cannot transmit the human soul. This immediacy, this unmediated connection, is at the center of the great mystery, the magic of how some artworks affect and stir us. <laughs> My family jokes that I still carve with the hammer and chisel because I just want to do everything the hardest way possible. But what I've discovered is that when I tackle hard and difficult things, two important things happen. First, my body adapts and hardens for the task. How many of you have gone camping and slept on the ground? The first night is universally awful. There's no getting around it. But the next night is better, and after a couple more nights, I'm fine. What started as hard turns out to be not so bad as my body adjusts. But the other thing that happens when I embrace difficulty, and this is really fascinating to me, is that my creative energy fires up. My inner resources awaken and rise to the challenge, just like my body. Solving problems turns out to be a great way to engage my creativity. My best solutions have been born of painful necessity. Let me share a humbling example. Carving this sculpture, a mistake was made, and the base of the larger form had to be unexpectedly shortened. I was devastated. Ultimately, I grafted another stone to the sculpture using this unusual joint. The form, and more importantly, the metaphor, were expanded. The solution seems to suggest that we are standing on the shoulders of what came before. And of course, we always are. It's a stronger sculpture for the error and for the creativity it took to get to the solution. When I'm missing something I need to make a sculpture, my first impulse is to feel exasperated and think, I cannot proceed. But then I remember that 
the, some of the best works of civilization were created with the most basic of tools. Obstacles just like mine fired the creativity of ancient peoples to tolerances we struggle to match today. The Inca civilization had neither the wheel, iron tools, nor a written language. Yet they created these walls from hammer stones, not even chisels. From 10 ton blocks, they dragged five miles across a mountainous valley. The workmanship is so tight, you can't put paper between the joints. The walls so strong, they have survived more than 50 earthquakes over 6.0 on the Richter scale without losing a single stone. I only wish that I had designed and built them. The pyramids at Giza were built by ordinary people who placed by hand 800 tons of stone every day. Think of it, 800 tons, quarried, shaped, fabricated, moved to the site and installed. The needs of the project were so great, they had to first invent geometry. <laughs> Amazing. Earlier civilizations faced many of the same threats we face today. They had natural disasters and heartbreaking pandemics. They suffered social unrest and unstable political leadership. Creatively, they found ways to succeed. Listen, I'm, I'm not anti-technology, and I'm certainly not one of those pining away for a time before anesthesia. But I work every day not to let the promise of technology rob me of my own agency or creativity. I absolutely refuse for it to make me passive or afraid to try and accomplish really hard things over long periods of time. Technology is sexy, and it seems to offer me shortcuts. But what I find is that it can also rob me of deeper expression and considered impact. I try to remember that my creativity is not device dependent. On the contrary, working more simply forces my creativity into play. It calls it forth, demands my full attention, and makes it part of my tool set. So let's try something. Let yourself dream of a project too big to complete in a single lifetime. Draw a sketch of your idea using paper. Build a simple model using popsicle sticks or, or cut it out of blocks of zucchini and stack it up. Tackle it with simple tools under imperfect conditions. Nurture that idea over weeks and then months. Chip away at it through the seasons. Do it the hard way. See how your body adjusts. First your body, then your soul then your creative spirit. Things feel hard right now. These are times requiring our creativity. Thank you. That was Richard Rhodes on doing things the hard way. We asked Richard what objects he would choose to represent his talk, and he sent over these, which are the actual tools he uses to carve stone. Now, this is called a bell hammer. It was a mainstay of the Freemasons Guild, and it comes from Siena, Italy, where he apprenticed as a stone carver. The, the design is ancient. There are Egyptian tomb carvings that show the same design from some 3,000 years ago. And this is a chisel, which he made by hand. Richard says he's likely made thousands of these chisels in his lifetime, but his special bell hammer he hopes to take to his grave. And now let's turn it over to Nick, who wants to thank some partners and also give away a segue. Thanks, Deborah. So to put on an event of this scale, 
takes the support of a lot of professionals, production professionals, if you would. And I want to take a moment to acknowledge a number of those professionals who have helped us make today a reality. First, Red Element Studios. They're the ones who produced, edited, filmed all of the videos that you've seen today. They're also the ones behind the wheel of today's live stream. So big shout out to Red Element Studios. Uh, we also want to acknowledge AD, AV Factory. They helped us uh, on the day that we filmed our talk. So thank you, AV Factory, for your support. Uh, uh, Silver Fox, uh, another organization that we worked with, they oversaw the creation of all of the speaker slides, so all those visuals that you see during their talks. So big shout out to Silver Fox. We're really excited to work with them, especially in a year where we know visuals are so important. Um, Mike Nakamura over at Nakamura Photography, all of those beautiful headshots that you've seen of the speakers on our website and throughout social, those were all his work. Um, big thank you to Mike over at, Mike Nak uh, at Nakamura Photography. Uh, if you've been to the TEDx Seattle website at any point in the last few months, you've probably seen the Other Sides logo. That was a creative masterpiece work from uh, Dapper and Associates, we're really happy to have been able to work with them this year. They also were the creative masterminds behind the Shift logo from last year's event. So thank you to Dapper and Associates. Um, another big shout out to Interplay Experience Design. This set that you see behind me today was done by them. Uh, there are a lot of the creative muscle behind also these interactive experiences that we've had throughout the day. Okay, now, the moment we've all been waiting for. We're going to give away the Segway 9Bot S. Um, we're gonna give a new member of our audience a new form of transportation. So, uh, we haven't done this before. This is gonna be a little unique. Uh, we're doing this live, we'll see how it goes. But uh, I think it's time for us to introduce our winner for today, and we're gonna try and bring them up on video. That winner is Susie Locke. Susie, hello. <laughs> Hi, how are you? Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> it's great to see you. So cool. Yeah, so you've won oh the new God. Segway 9Bot S. Um, a quick question oh for you. God. Where do you wanna to ride to first? Where do you, you wanna go on your new Segway? I want to go to the lake <laughs> on the dock. There's okay. a really cool trail. I don't know. <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> Great. Everywhere. Perfect. I love it. All right. Well, our team will get in touch with you to get you your new segue, but thank you so much for, uh, for participating. Thank you so much. I love right. TEDx. <laughs> See you, Susie. Uh, if you want to learn more Bye. about Segway and the work that they've done uh, with our organization, TEDx Seattle, head over to segway.com slash TEDx. With that, I'm going to turn it back over to Deborah to close us out. Thank you, Nick. And thank you, everyone. We have come to the end of our TEDx Seattle pandemic year 2020. And we thank all of you for joining us. Thanks to our wonderful speakers and our performers and our artists who did such an amazing job today. Uh, but most of all, thanks to you, because you are what make TEDx Seattle possible. You are what make TEDx Seattle special. I wish I could be there in person to thank all of you. Uh, hopefully we can do that again in the near future. Please do stay in touch with us. Um, we'd love to hear from you on social media. Please sign up for our newsletter. And on our website, TEDxSeattle.com, we're going to have announcements for things that are coming up in the coming months. Um, we'd also love it if you would go to our website and take our audience survey. We'd love to know what worked for you, what didn't work for you, and what more you would like to see from us in the future. So we will see you next year, hopefully in the flesh, fingers crossed, with many more ideas worth spreading. In the meantime, please take care of yourselves. Be safe, be healthy. For Nick Hart and everyone on the TEDx Seattle crew, see you later.